Hello, welcome to our very first Judicon. I'm Kimberly Trung. We are live. I'm gonna give folks a few minutes to join. Any last uh, minute uh, stragglers to come in. In the meantime, can you drop in the chat um, uh, who you are and uh, and uh, where you're from? Very global audience. We're excited to have everyone. Uh, it's going to be a good turnout. Uh, this is the beginning of a of a just kicking off the flagship event, right? This is a we're the first session of the yeah, first conference. Big. I know this is big. We're excited. People from all over, um, and uh, we're just excited to teach and to share. Uh, so uh, we love this topic, and uh, just very confident in this being um, you know good value for everyone. Madison, I've seen Madison, Boulder, Wisconsin. Brazil. Yeah, Brazil, France, Sweden. Oh, yeah. South Carolina. We're all over the place. We are all Nashville. over the place. I'm in yeah, Chicago. Canada. I'm in Chicago. That's all. I'm in Boston. You're in Boston. Patty. All and right. Ireland. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Several from Brazil. <laughs> uh, Kim, where are you right now? I'm actually in the Denver area. Okay. We got a bit of snow today. Um, I'm just north of Denver. I uh, was taking a quick uh, jaunt to our Denver office here uh, in uh, Louisville. I see Boulder. It's a, um, a couple people from Minneapolis. Hi, David. I see you, David. Lee Summit, M Montana. Is it Missouri, MO, right? Oh. And there's a there's a Wind sunny effect. Florida. <laughs> a couple of sunny Canadians. Florida always has to rub it in when we're talking about the snow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Tel Aviv in Tel Aviv. the house. Ooh. Hi, yeah. Anna. All right. Wow, I'm this give... is fantastic. Okay. Right. I'm gonna give people 30 more seconds. Oh yeah, keep it coming in. San Antonio in the house. Florianopolis. <laughs> Johannesburg. Okay. I think, John, good to see you. John from the UK. I've counted four continents so far. England. Wisconsin, yeah, it must be so cold there. <laughs> so Denmark, sorry. Mexico City, Mars, Mars. welcome. Mars, yep. We're... Planet interplanetary yeah. a broadcast here. Great. Um, folks, let's go ahead and get this party started. Um, as you may have already heard, I am Kimberly Trung, and I'm super excited to welcome you to our very first Dudacon. What is Dudacon, you ask? Well, it's a three-day event full of informative live talks, the first one being right now, that we believe will help you fulfill those New Year's resolutions that you've made for your business. How do you know what my New Year's resolutions are, you ask? Well, because you told us. We sent out a survey asking agencies what your New Year's resolutions were. And thanks to your feedback, the entire Dudacon agenda is tailored to what the people demanded. So each session is going to give you real world practical tips so you can keep on building those amazing websites and incorporate the latest industry trends and knowledge into your upcoming projects. So um, before we get started, just a quick reminder um, and a quick, well, I didn't say this yet, so I will remind you again, but the, for the first time, uh, we are gonna be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, just drop them in the chat as they pop into your mind. You don't need to wait. There's not gonna be a formal Q and A session. We're just gonna answer questions on the fly. So drop them in the chat. I'm uh, keeping an eye out and we'll answer them as we can. Okay, enough of me. Let's get this party started. To kick things off, I am so excited to pass the mic to our very first Dudacon guest, Nancy Harhut and Andy Crestadina. Nancy, can you go ahead and kick things off with a quick intro? Absolutely, Kim. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone to Thank Dudacon. You. My name is Nancy Harhut. I am the uh, co-founder and chief creative officer at HPT Marketing. And our specialty is applying behavioral science to marketing best practices in order to increase response. So I am very excited for today's session. And uh, Andy, over to you. Nancy, you're obviously the perfect person to be here because that's the whole point is response. <laughs> you have, you know so much about how the human brain works and, and doesn't work together in a digital context. So uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Andy Crestadina. I'm one of the co-founders of Orbit Media Studios. Orbit's a web design and development firm that we founded in 2001. 
Uh, we're a team of 48 people. The company is built entirely on an organic and content marketing approach. And I've been part of the planning process for many hundreds of websites. Uh, our company here has done something like 1,500 projects uh, in those 21 years. Uh, and I've been personally part of the planning process for at least, I don't know, 500 websites. We're on a quest to just build the perfect page to, con to maximize conversion rates and, uh, and get response, as Nancy said. So uh, without further ado, Kim, I'm ready to jump in. Let's do it. We're so excited. Excellent. I'm going to share this screen. Again, reminder, folks, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat. There's not a formal Q&A. Um, we will just answer questions on the fly. Very good. Tell me when you can see what I'm seeing. Are we ready? I Not yet, I don't I think. I don't see it on my end yet. Uh, OK, let's try that again. Share. <laughs> Share screen, screen sharing tips. We don't need to see those again. Screen two, share. Chromecast has lost permission to capture your screen. One second, please. Mac oh, no, just when you don't want this to happen. One moment, please. Privacy, screen sharing. Unbelievable. Uh, these things happen in the meantime. Hi, Rhode Island. Hi, Quebec. Hi, Barbara Casey. <laughs> Sorry. And then somehow I left the stream yard. Uh, folks, this is... <laughs> Not that we felt abandoned, Kim. You know, I won't go that far, but... <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Anywho, again, yeah, drop in the chats where you're from. Maybe you have some... Oh, my God. Gallifrey Interactive. Have you tried turning it off and on? That, <laughs> that is the. That is the. That is the solution to most yeah, things. Yeah, that's... Um... Isn't it, though? It really is. Uh, this is not a joke. I'm being 100% serious. There is a uh, there is a joke about this. There's um, uh, a Microsoft engineer, a mechanical engineer, and an electrical engineer are driving across the country, and they the car breaks down, and the mechanical engineer says, "That's oh, probably the fuel pump," and the electrical engineer says, uh, uh, um, "Check the spark plugs." And the Microsoft engineer says, get out of the cart, open all the doors, close all the doors, and open all the windows and close all the windows. <laughs> Screen sharing. Problem solved. I love it. And did you see how he was able to deliver that joke while he was still kind of, you know, working I, his technology? Nancy, Pretty I was good, just, huh? I was just, that, that is some multitasking right there yeah. that I would not be able to do on my own. Um, and then I can also pull up your slides, Andy, if... Uh, if you have them, yes. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we're going to do as a plan B here. I'm going to I really don't want to spend the extra time. No, I know. Um, Here, would you be able to, to cue us forward when I when I give us the when I Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Thank goodness for plan B's. Yeah. Well, and you know what? This speaks to uh, the human uh, brain disposition to take the easy way out. And that's what we're doing right now. We can't get the first thing working. We're going to go to plan B. It's easy. And that's what the human first. brain likes to do. We like to find the easy way. So Nancy, I love we're kicking it off way. perfect. So it's a great way to kick things off. It was one could even say it was deliberate. Classic. I don't. I'm not going to steal any secrets. So typical. <laughs> so many things we've done. So many hundreds of webinars here. Uh, is that working for you, Kim? Yes. Here, give me one second. I'm going to now share my screen. Which hopefully, folks, thanks for bearing with us. <laughs> Welcome to 2022, the year of the Plan Bs. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good insight, Elizabeth. Yes. Okay. Oh, nope. Hey, All we right. can see it. Hey, can you see it? Yep, yep. Let's jump right to slide six. We're going to make up a minute here. Okay. I've got, we're sharing these slides. So I've got a screencast video here where you can actually watch the eye move around of a visitor on a page. We're going to skip past that and I want to go straight to this slide about deconstructing. It'll be the next two. Go ahead, advance one, please, Kim. There we go. Deconstructing a website visit. Okay, I'm going to start with the zero moment of truth. Next slide. This is what your visitor is doing somewhere in the world. Right now, as we speak, their hands are moving toward the keyboard, and they're looking for you. They had that zero moment of truth where they know that you can help them. The next thing that happens generally, next slide, is that they think to themselves, I'm either going to get a referral, hey, you should look at this company, or I'm going to go to search. Either way, doesn't matter which, either way, they're going to, next slide, land on your company's website. Okay, now what happens? Next, 
We're going to fly through this, Kim. This Great. person is asking these questions. It's the context. We're going to do user-centered design, and it's about what's in their mind. It's not about what we want them, we want them to see. It's about what they're looking for here. What does this company do? How do they do it? Can they do it for me specifically? That's basically what the visitor's thinking. Next. Am I in the right place as a way to summarize this? This is the first question everybody asks as every web page loads. Am I in the right place? Let's go through and see what, see what they say. Next. They see a big, clever headline. They see a call to action. They see a small descriptive subhead. The descriptive part is smaller. They're not necessarily exactly sure what you do. Next. Okay. Now, the, when the subhead says what we do, that's not specific. It's we love us talking about us. Now, okay, I'm getting <laughs> some idea for what you do. Next. The stock photo, no reaction. Doesn't help them at all. It's super expected. It's undifferentiated, unimpressed. Next slide. Service name. Ah, now I see, you know, a little bit more specific, but you're still talking about yourselves. I'm still not sure if you can solve my problem specifically. And then finally, we go to the next slide, which is has a big blocky paragraph. I don't really have time for this. I know there's lots of options. Remember, if they came from search, they saw a ton of alternatives. And your website and my website have one feature in common. It's the back button. We have to <laughs> live in fear a little bit that the person's going to leave. So we're going to we're going to pull them deeper through this experience by being specific. Specificity correlates with conversion. This was mostly pretty vague. So next slide, we're going to try this again. Next slide, I'm going to break it down. Same context. Next, same visitor. Am I in the right place? A clear descriptive header, completely different experience. Does your header actually say what you do? It doesn't pass the backyard barbecue test. If I asked you what you do and you told me you read to me your homepage header, would I know what you do or is it super vague? Interesting, unexpected subhead, call to action. Next, instant visual credibility, the logos, the awards, the partners, the technology companies that you work with. So at a glance, you are different than the competitors. I can see that you're legit. Next, you're going to explain what you do with a quick video. You've upgraded the format. It's beyond text. It's an actual video. Ah, their approach looks interesting. Their approach looks thoughtful. Makes sense. Next, we're going to get into the details. Now you can be clever, right? After you're clear, now you can be clever. You're answering my questions. Remember, that's why the visitor came to this page is to get their questions answered. They didn't find out. They didn't come to see how much, you know, how, how much you love yourselves or, you know, uh, just bland copy that you can find at any website. They want their say The job of this page is basically to answer is to emulate a sales conversation. What do people ask you during sales? You need to answer those questions here in the sale in the marketing context. And then the next thing that comes after the answer, thank you, is the evidence to support the answer. Here's the top level framework of a high converting page. Answer evidence, answer evidence, call to action. It's what they came for, answers. It's what you want them to find, evidence to support those answers, and then clear, specific, compelling CTAs, right? So that video there, or that, uh, that testimonial there is social proof. They're legit. See the differentiation? The logos, that's specific to you. The testimonial, that's specific to you. Go ahead and scan through any of your pages and ask yourself, is there anything here that only you can say? Lots of sites. It's all generic. Next. Okay. So basically, I've deconstructed it for you here. Again, we're sharing these slides. This is the jobs to be done. This is the job of each of the page blocks. This is how the visual hierarchy, yes, every page has a visual hierarchy, guides the visitor eyes through a series of messages. Yes, there is a messaging priority. And when the visual hierarchy and the messaging priority align, now you've got a page that can convert the visitor, right? It's like, it's like they're on the phone with you. It's like answering their questions, addressing their objections, and adding evidence to support those answers. Makes sense, right? Can you do it for me? And have you done it for other people like me? Next. I want my copy to sound different. Very common request. We all work with clients. <laughs> I think everyone here is on, on, you know, on team web design. Clients want their site to sound different. But here's the risk. You're going to see this next. It is a, uh, if the, if the header is the, the top of the page is clear, they know what you do. They know they're in the right place, right? Don't differentiate yourself in the H1 at the top. If it's, you know, people, I, I see sites all the time. It's like humanizing technology or pioneering a new way or, you know, contingencies for all futures. What? I can't, I don't know what you do yet. You can't assume that the visitor already knows that you, what you do, right? It's also bad for search, by the way, to like, no one's searching for humanizing technology. Be clever, but be clever farther down. Don't prioritize the clever. Prioritize the clear. Next, you can see that we get to uh, the elements of a high converting page. So I'm sharing this. Um, there's a there's a di there's a diagram. 
literally, this is a way to, and probably, I don't know if StreamYard's gonna, gonna show this. This might be animated. If you go to the next slide, you'll see. This, I'm deconstructing it for you. That slide, we're gonna show the diagram. It deconstructs for you the structure, the elements of a high converting page. You can use it as a checklist. Go through each of your pages and just ask if they include those elements or if you missed any opportunities. And if you did so, did you do so deliberately? Google made a playbook for UX and it has specific things. Uh, we're sharing the link. It has specific things that they know to correlate with response, with you know, uh, high time on page, with low bounce rates, with high conversion rates, the percentage of visitors who took action and became a lead. So that first column there and the next slide, I think you're going to see, I've got them highlighted for you. Like these are literally the things that I just recommended. A clear specific CTA above the fold, right? Clear benefit oriented value proposition, not humanizing technology, but Chicago website and development, right? No, um, I'm going to avoid using interstitials. I'm going to remove automatic carousels. We're going to see examples here at the end of some of uh, those done. And social proof, right? The testimonial, that's differentiation. And answers to questions, that's remember why they came to this page in the first place. Okay, let's keep going. So now I want my site to look different. I want my site to look different, right? That's a very common request. No one wants their site. I don't want my site to look like a template. You hear that all the time. I don't want my site to feel like WordPress. You hear that all the time. But but what? how can that be done well or be done badly? So now we're going to see in the next slide here, this is the, or we can go proceed to the next one. This is a site that looks different. Very unusual, right? Strikes people from a different direction. Yeah, but it's also super weird. This is does not align with best practices because look, look at the visual hierarchy. The only warm color here is the is the the share envelope. What? That is actually, and no one's going to share the home page. This is the worst place to put share widgets. Bottom right vertical navigation. Yes, it's unexpected, but your job isn't to be unexpected in how it's used. The job is to be unexpected in the information it gives. Unexpectedly helpful, unexpectedly informative, right? It's some unexpected angle for the for the copy. Don't differentiate in your usability. I highly recommend against it. And there's actually data for this. If you go to the next slide, you're going to see some research, also done by by Google. Uh, they found a correlation between prototypicality. That's what I just said. Makes things that look like, you know, that conform to usability standards. They're prototypical in their structure and usability and, and um, interaction. And it perceived beauty. Visitors are more likely to perceive the, in other words, I've spelled it out. The most beautiful designs show one thing at a time, low visual complexity, and they don't use unexpected usability. Really, really important. If you've got clients that are pushing back, asking you to do weird stuff, just share this research. Andy, okay. would, it, would it be fair to say that uh, people don't want to have to think, right? They're, they're looking for something, they want to find it, and they don't want to have to really work at it. So the easier you can make it, the better off you'll be. Thank you, Nancy. Frictionless is a term you hear a lot. Um, you know, and if there's a, and you can just test anything you make maybe with a five second test. Just put someone in your chair and just ask them to do, you know, give them a simple task. But yeah, you don't want they, you don't want them to have to think. You want it to, be, you know, we all like intuitive. So prioritize intuition, intuitive design over um, weird differentiated UX. Thanks for that. Uh, there's research on this. If you could just click through the next three quickly. Weird layout, straight layout, and then higher conversion rate. <laughs> so Unbounce has tested this. You can find all kinds of examples of this, right? Your job is to make it a simple, clear flow. In, you know, if there's two things at the same scroll depth that are of different weight and different topic, what are you expecting the visitor's eye to do? Web design is a Jedi mind trick. You're trying to control the eye, guiding the eye through a series of messages. That's what experience design is. But if you don't really make tough choices about what they're supposed to do at a certain scroll depth, or you want them to bounce all over, or you create a big grid with like different colors, different places, much, much harder for the visitor to scan. So moving right along, I'm going to make the stronger case for the descriptive header, because on the next slide, you'll see I put a bunch of B2B home pages into Hotjar and took all the scroll heat maps out and made a composite. This is a composite scroll heat map from a bunch of B2B service companies' home pages. Okay. So literally, like I, I can see on average, the percentage of visitors that scroll, it's not much. It's not much. The majority of your visitors are very likely, and you could test for yourself, right? Use this tool. It's a hot jar, scroll heat map. Uh, the majority of visitors are going to look at the headline and then go straight to this, the main navigation and begin getting around the website. Kind of a problem, right? <laughs> kind of a problem. Okay, on the next slide, you're going to see one that does this uh, sort of badly. Better together? What? What does that mean? Uh, next slide, I'm, I'm going to start making fun of these. 
The largest text is actually very vague. The small text is very specific, super common. C sites just flip it, right? If the big tech, if the big thing is super vague and the small thing is very specific and helpful, you can fix the design just by flipping the H1 and H2. Happens all the time. So just ask yourself, is the most visually prominent thing, usually the biggest thing, the thing surrounded by white space or the thing with the contrasting color, is the most visually prominent thing at this scroll depth also the most helpful, important, compelling thing? Should be, right? Should be. Is the, it, is the visual hierarchy aligned with the messaging priority? So visual prominence, we're creating a visual hierarchy. That's our job in design. Next slide, you're going to see I'm going to use a usability hub test, a five-second test. Just upload a homepage, you know, above the fold homepage image to, to usability hub. And then if you scroll down this, you're going to see nobody, uh, nobody understood what that site was about. Putting your people first. What? Like, and the five-second test is real humans are sitting there looking at this for five seconds, scrolling down, telling, answering a question, what does this company do? And they didn't get it, right? If you've got clients asking you to do weird stuff, you can use this as a way to kind of get them back. The next slide you're going to see, leadership coaching and training for mid-level managers. What does this company do? 100% agreement, 0% <laughs> confusion. So Nancy, what do you think? We're not making them think? So exactly. You know, I mean, if, if this is what you're looking for, you land and in seconds you realize I'm in the right place, right? You don't have to think about it. You don't have to scratch your head and wonder. And most importantly, you don't decide to go looking someplace else because people want that instant gratification. And if they land someplace and they don't think they're in the right place, they're going to go, you know, and this solves the problem. Make sure that they don't go. I, thank you. I really wanted to reinforce that. Like, am I in the right place? Don't assume that your visitor already knows that, that, that it's their 10th visit or that they were a referral. And by the way, it's also like, if anyone here cares about search, I'm like, a, I've been doing SEO for 20 years, a keyword focused header, <laughs> if you're not doing that, the page is just not optimized. Don't even pretend, you're not even trying, you're not in the game at all. Leadership coaching, that's a phrase people search for, training for mid-managers, phrase people search for. Okay, now, now I wanna go on to the, ne the next topic, which is the navigation labels. Again, super prominent visually. It's almost always at the top of the visual hierarchy because the homepage visitor, page loads, reads the headline. That's at the high, top of the hierarchy, but then quickly moves up to scan the navigation labels. So next you're going to see me. I kind of mocked this up. Product services about blog contact. Why did you name your navigation labels the same as 100 million other websites? Can the visitor tell what you do? Can the visitor even, do, what does your navigation label say at a glance? Just take a screenshot of that and put it on Usability Hub and ask. You won't even need to. It's super obvious. 0% of people can tell what this company does by scanning the navigation labels. Next. Aha. Point made. <laughs> you get the idea. We can keep going. Okay. So now this isn't a bad example. About, you know, home, about, solutions, news, contact. You, you Really, it's not at all obvious. You know, the name doesn't tell you. You'd have to, you'd have to scroll down and, like, look at the, look at the label. Um, so now I want to go down to scroll down the page a little bit more, and we're going to look at next, please, Kim, the, the meaningful subheaders. Very simple example. Just look closely at any page. This one has subheaders that say this, our products, ideas and insights, and our customers. It took me less than three minutes of just reading deeper into the text to figure out that these headers missed a big chance to be much more specific. Simple way to think about this, specificity correlates with conversion. Did you use? Did you miss an opportunity to use a keyword? Did you miss an opportunity to be explicit about what this, what the value is offered? So next, you'll see how I rewrote these: our baking and pastry products. That's what they do. Why didn't you? Why didn't you just write our products? Right? Why didn't you? Why weren't you specific? A lot of people say like I've, I've seen examples. You got a lot of you submitted your own sites. Say, our work. Why not say what kind of work? Right? Um, web design projects. Web development work. Uh, ideas and insights, that was actually new ideas from their bakery. Ideas and insights is generic to millions of sites. Please don't do that. Our customers, when I read that, no, it was a big opportunity to use evidence. Years in business is evidence. It's not social proof, but it's proof how long you've been around. So 100 years of quality baking ingredients. It's evidence and it's keyword focused. So this is, um, so the subheads are one where I'm a big nerd for this. Any of your sites, any of your client sites, just scan down and ask yourself if your subheads missed any opportunities to be keyword specific. Or it, maybe if, if there's no opportunity to be keyword, keyword specific, just remove the whole subhead. I do this. I close one eye and I put out my thumb and I cover up a piece of the page and I ask myself, would this, be, would this page be just as good without that? If yes, it's visual noise. Remove it. 
you can make any page perform better by just removing visual noise. If it doesn't add value, why is it? Why, why are these pixels on this page? Okay. Uh, next, you're going to see it. This one is a testimonial. It's a carousel. You got to click on one of those icons, which are meaningless. You can't really tell what they mean. The big text is actually very vague. What our customers are saying doesn't actually say what your customers are saying. What we do doesn't actually say what you do. The smallest thing here, right? It's like, I love the people in the innovation. The smallest thing here is the most valuable thing. Again, is the most visually prominent thing, also the most valuable, helpful, compelling thing. In this case, definitely not. Next, you'll see the carousel is also a problem because the subsequent slides are definitely not going to get seen. Following this, you're going to see here a testimonial, a video testimonial. Kim will show us here. The next slide is a, this is a, an example of a completely upgraded <laughs> testimonial. First of all, it's video. Secondly, it's got a subhead that answers a question. After all, that's why they're here is to get their questions answered. That's what people are basically thinking when they're on these pages. I've got an excerpt from the video. The video thumbnail actually has a quote from the video again, calling it out. So I'm doing everything possible to maximize the impact of this bit of social proof. Um, it is 100x, right? At least the impact of one of those others. Okay, so then I put, I've been repeating this, but Kim's gonna go to the next slide. You're gonna see my point. Is the visually prominent thing also the most compelling thing? Quite simple. Let's go forward a couple of slides, social proof. Obviously, it's a powerful tactic. Next slide, you're going to see types of social proof. Have you missed any chances to include these? How many of these are on your site? Any of these? A page without evidence is literally a pile of unsupported marketing claims. A court case without evidence is a lawyer trying to explain to a jury with no one in the witness box, right? This is our job is to add social proof. Nancy, I know you have a ton of thoughts about this. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, social proof is, it's something that we all rely on. If we're not sure what decision to make, we look around, we look at other people, we see what they're doing, we follow their lead. There are two things I want to add about social proof. One is, um, if you're using a testimonial, the closer the testimonial giver is to the testimonial reader, mm. the better off you are. So if you're marketing to small businesses, have your testimonial from a small business. If you can be even more granular, a small business in a particular industry or a particular geographic location, that's great. If you're marketing to new moms, have a testimonial from a new mom. And here's the, the second and the more important uh, tip for testimonials. And that is, if you can find one that starts from a place of skepticism, that is a good testimonial. So you may, you know, if you get a testimonial that says, you know, well, we love Nancy's widgets, I'd be like, oh, that's a great testimonial, right? But if, if I get a testimonial instead that said, you know, I thought all widgets were the same, but I decided to try Nancy's. Oh my goodness, hers were so much better than any of the other ones I'd tried in the past. You're like, that is perfect because that place of skepticism is where your prospective customer is going to be. They're going to be wondering, is it as good as the marketer says it is? Uh, can I really believe it? Is it better than this current solution I have? Is it better than this other solution I'm considering? Is it worth the time and effort to find out? Is it worth the cost? These are all the things that people are wondering. And if you can find a testimonial that, that starts there, that addresses that, people are going to say, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. But, uh, you know, Andy gave it a try and he seems to think, you know, Nancy's widgets are good. Therefore, I guess it's safe for me to give it a try. So, you know, Good testimonials are good, but great testimonials start from a place of skepticism. So those are my two points on, on social proof and testimonials. I love that. It's uh, and, and just to add to that a little bit, I mean, you know, if you scan through your page and ask yourself, could anybody say these things? Could anybody make these claims? What percentage of the stuff on any of your pages are things that only you can say? A testimonial is one of those things, right? Nobody else has your testimonial. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. It's a problem. I look at sites and I ask myself, like, could a startup born yesterday make this exact same page? If yes, you know, we got to like, <laughs> I don't know. It's one of those things. Like it's like faces of your team. You're the only company with your team. Are there things on your site that are unique to you? Okay. There's obviously a bunch of other ones in here. We're going to click through quickly some other ones. Uh, some So that's endorsements, which are like an in, a testimonial from an influencer. As seen in, makes perfect sense, right? More endorsements. Most of this page is evidence. Most of this page is evidence. We once analyzed uh, Amazon product detail pages, 50 plus percent of those pages are evidence. It's all star reviews and bestseller and like the, all the different reviews, the, the written, not reviews below. Next, you're going to see one that's just like uh, actually very visible because it's global. Um, the next going next, you're going to see, uh, um, oh yeah, um, visitors. So 
I'll share this research, but we did some analysis. We surveyed a bunch of B2B website owners and then, sur and then surveyed a bunch of B2B website visitors to see what the differences are. No, visitors did not. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an empathetic person and I believe in user-centered design, but uh, I also need to sell. So there are, there's moments where you put something on the page because you're injecting it into the visitor's field of vision. They didn't ask for it, but you wanted to show them anyway, right? Visitors tend not to go to testimonials pages. That's fine. Um, but, but we still want them to see what, what we're giving them. I'll show you an example in a second. Let's keep going. So as seen in visual credibility, right? They're the only company with these logos, at least in this pest management uh, category. And, and these are all the things that quietly build confidence, right? Uh, you know, people may not be, you know, consciously processing, oh, I see that testimonial. Oh, I see these uh, product or company logos. But they're all just adding to people feeling confident about doing business with you. And that's so important because people make decisions based on their emotions, right? And they're going to feel good about landing on your page, doing some business with you. So we want to do all of these things that are going to make them feel good, make them feel confident. It's a big, it's a big difference. And so we're, that that's the page as the visitor. I tried to show that at the beginning, like the psychology as they scroll through the page, their trust should be growing, right? It should be increasing as we go. Okay. Next, you're going to see my case again. Uh, oh, some work, uh, global elements. Footer is a global element. It appears on every page. So that's a place to put any kind of award or any credential or security certificates or things like that. Um, very powerful. It feels, you know, they're, they're even if it's a small percentage, even if only 5% of the 5% percent of visitors make it to the bottom of the page. That's a lot of people over time. Um, that scroll heat map I showed, well, if looking at those will bias you toward focus on the top of the page. Good idea. But don't ignore even low numbers. Five, 10 percent of people make it to the footer. That's still quite a few people. OK, now you're going to see my case against. Uh, I'm going to use data for this. We can keep going one more. Uh, the, here's the, the oh, we're, we're going to stay with testimonials for a minute, choosing the messenger for the message. And then in the next slide, I'm going to make the case for um, adding, uh, taking the best part out of the testimonial and making it the subhead. Isn't that nice? That's, yeah, that's really nice because, you know, I mean, as much as we like to think people are going to read every page on the uh, the site, they don't. I think they read, uh, what, about 40% based on Nielsen Norman research? Uh, or 20 20, 20 percent. Thank you. Even even better or even worse, I guess. Right. But so anything we can do to make the key elements pop. So you got this, you know, great testimonial, but pull out a key phrase and make it the headline. And if that's all they read, they get the, the essence of it. Such a smart idea. Yeah, that's um, uh, I learned that from another um, another uh, uh, conversion analyst. Um, so yeah, and also I'm looking pretty in the uh, face sorry, there too. Can I interject real quick? We got a really good question that came in. Um, how can new businesses build credibility? Oh, uh, so you're, uh, we're going to look at an example of one. Oh. One of the ways that sites are credible is just by showing the people at the company. So uh, I think even little businesses, even brand new companies can look quite credible just by showing themselves and making the, and explaining first person, like with uh, like sometimes video, um, this channel here, video webinar, I'm probably more, more credible right now than I would be if I typed this all out. So I think upgrading the format and keeping the messenger, the personal, you know, brand, the business, the business, uh, owner or founder, um, is a way to, is a huge opportunity to build credibility. Nancy, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, you know, one of the other things, cause it's a great question. Like, okay, we're, we're starting from scratch. We're brand new. You know, I don't have this list of clients mm -hmm. and this list of testimonials. Um, right. but one of the things you can do is, um, you can talk about other things you've done, maybe, you know, in a past life, maybe, you know, in a different company or, you know, with different experience. So maybe your particular company that you're just starting hasn't done certain things or work with certain clients, but maybe the people in it have, and, you know, you can leverage that. So it's, it's your, you know, as, as you were saying, Andy, it's your, your bio and your background, but it's also your past experiences. I, you know, I know, um, uh, I, I know several different uh, ad agencies that, you know, started up and they basically said, hey, look, you know, here are the, all the different places we've worked at. You know, here are all the different places our client, our, our employees have worked at. Here are the different accounts we've worked on. And uh, so you think, OK, I'm, I'm buying the person. So this is great. And it does add that credibility. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, the same is true for like uh, professional services, law firms, accounting firms, you know, financial planners. You're hiring the person. These sites need to be more human than ever. I think it's ironic that uh, little companies are always trying to look bigger and bigger companies are always trying to look smaller. <laughs> How weird is that? Everyone should just try to be more human, be more personal. 
Yeah, that's so a great observation. You're so right. So <laughs> weird. Why do they <laughs> just be yourself? <laughs> There's a great quote from Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. It's taken. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and it's so true. It's so oh, true. Okay. We're gonna we're going to uh uh, we'll keep going. We're going to get some great questions, but I want to wrap this up so we can make a bit more of a dialogue. Okay, this is a carousel. So there's a there's an arrow where you can go see the subsequent slide, right? This is a testimonial slider we had on our site. If you click next, you see this one, which was pretty compelling, right? It said like, this is the best decision I've made in business in 25 years. What percentage of people see the second slide? You'll see according to the hot jar, it's only 5.7%. Mm. Most do not see the second slide. So when you make, when you make a carousel, you might feel like, oh, I put that there so people can see more. Actually, what you did was you hid it until people interact. Why are you hiding these things? You're making them less visible. What's the alternative? Just stack them up. Next slide, you're going to see only 5.7 of people clicked to proceed, but 28% of people scrolled past. So I can quintuple the visibility of the subsequent testimonial by piling them up instead of putting them inside a carousel. Data. I don't think anyone can disagree, right? It's like, clearly that will be more visible. Scrolling, 100% of your visitors have their finger on a scroll wheel, a trackpad, or a, a piece of glass, right? To aiming and tapping, even on a big tap target, it's like just way more work. Nobody wants to do that. Okay, next slide. Um, testimonials page, sounds great. Got lots of them. Put them all on a page, right? This is a super popular, very famous website. Next slide you're going to see, not so much testimonials pages are not popular. If, you're, if your website were a city, there'd be a highway flowing through it, right? It's called your behavior flow report. Is that, a, where, are you putting your billboards on the highways? Or are you putting your best stuff on little back streets? Uh, just check your analytics. If you have a testimonials page, my guess is that you, it's not a, one of your top pages. Now ask yourself why you put your powerful social proof on a page that's not that popular. The problem here is not the testimonials page itself, but it's I mean, the, the, you know, we should be making all of our pages testimonials pages. Fill your website with social proof. Don't hide those things over there because they're much less likely to be seen. Yeah, kind of sprinkle it around. Use it as seasoning as opposed to just having it all in one spot where it's really just too much. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there goes a long way. It'll be much, uh, much more effective for you. Yeah. And especially if it appears next to the, the question that, that they, you know, the answer that, that they had for their question. It's like, you know, shipping. And right below that, it says, wow, that came, that came way faster than I thought, right? So answer evidence, answer evidence, right. answer evidence. So you want yeah. to give them reasons, to keep giving them reasons to believe. Okay, moving on. Um, so that's a uh, that's an example of, a, of you know, putting, putting these on every single page. Uh, I think that kind of wraps it up. Oh, there's one more tip here for social proof. Uh, we're, you get an opportunity, right, to choose whatever social widgets you want. If share numbers are low, you get negative social proof kicking in. Big problem. <laughs> you look, look unpopular. This visitor is less likely to read this thing because it's got very low star reviews and zero shares. Not helpful. Um, so bottom line, uh, I made this case about Amazon. Here you can see a B2B service page filled with evidence, as seen in logos, video testimonials, reports, case studies are evidence, right? That's an example. Um, it's use case, details, statistics, characters, conflict, you know, there's people in it, <laughs> and then statistics and data down there at the bottom. Okay, that said, we want to share, uh, so, oh, when you say it, it's marketing, automatically, can't help it. Everything I type on my keyboard is automatically marketing. It's just because I'm a marketer. But when my audience says it, it sounds different. It's social proof. The tone is obviously, is, off, is often uh, disarmingly direct and unexpected, um, and also just changing the messenger for the message uh, is sometimes like sort of the only way to, uh, there's some messages where like, that's the only way to deliver it. You know, you, like, um, you know, we think we're great. Doesn't know it's radioactive, not going to work, not effective or helpful. Yeah, no, um, it's just so much more believable and credible when it, when it comes from someone else, from, from another customer like me, as opposed to the guy who's trying to sell me. Yeah. So that's what every message on your, in your marketing, on your website has a messenger what was the best messenger for that message? Was it you or someone else? And it as a format. Was it just text or did you upgrade it from text to images and from images to video? So uh, everything you've ever done, everything, every pixel, every, everything you put on every one of these client sites uh, is, it has a message. Yes, hopefully it's specific and not vague, but it also has a messenger and has a format. And when you think of it that way, you're going to have a, maybe a, a better chance of building conversion rates by, um, uh, by upgrading either of those two elements. 
Okay, I think we're ready to jump into some live website reviews, um, which will not be shared by me because my computer hates me at the moment. I'm not able to share my screen. So Kim, if you want to maybe, um, uh, should we just, uh, here we go. Yep, if you send me the link, I can open here, that up for here you. Here it comes. Okay, all we're right. gonna, we had, I think 370 submissions. So we're gonna do them all. <laughs> and, and, and February 1st, we're going to be all, all done. Just we're going to be here you're forever. At the, you're, you're, at the, you're at step one of what will be a highly engaging and informative conference <laughs> that will make you a better agency. But for now, uh, we're just going to, we only have time to do a couple of these before we're going to move on with the event. So uh, I just I just texted, or I chatted one to you in the chat there, Kim, if you see in the private I've got chat. it up. Um, cool. We do have a question in the queue uh, real quick before we jump into the live clinic. Are we required to get permission to add a client's logo to our page? Ask Bob Rebecca. Bob, I would not think that it's a requirement per se, but to do it without that has some small risk. Uh, they, you may irritate them if they see that they're on your website and you didn't talk to them about it. And also it's a missed opportunity. Because if you, uh, you saw my video testimonials, I'm just not throwing client logos on there. I'm talking to them. I'm asking them, you know, I'm calling every client after we launch their website. We do around 50 sites a year. And part of that is to, is to just confirm that they got served, you know, that they were happy. If they were extremely happy, now I'm asking for the testimonial. When you ask for the testimonial, you can ask for a testimonial on a specific topic that you know will support an unsupported claim on your site. When you ask for testimonials, you can sometimes get a testimonial that has a keyword in it if you're trying to improve the keyword relevance of a page that maybe almost ranks in search. And you know, you're going to get close. You're going to make a closer friend. You're going to be. You're not going to risk. You know, you can build trust, and you're kind of collaborating for a minute. You can also ask them if you'd like them to link to a specific page on their site. Maybe they want the SEO boost by having a, a link to a deeper page other than their homepage. A couple of reasons why I would definitely, um, you know, make it a conversation first. All right. I, I saw you. one other question pop up twice now, and that was, oh, yeah. uh, we were saying that like carousels aren't such a great idea. And two people said, what if they're automatic? Still less likely to, to be seen. Um, and, and what you're doing there, you have to be careful with anyway, because now you've added movement. Remember the visual hierarchy, movement is more powerful than images and images are more powerful than text. So when you're trying to manage a visual hierarchy by adding movement to a page, uh, be careful because it's extremely strong. Um, I don't think uh, I would avoid them if at all possible. That was Becky's question, Barbara's question. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, Barbara, and someone else mentioned it as well. They, it came up twice. So I was like, oh, we should get it in yeah. there then, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I apologize in advance if you guys were sending in questions. I cannot see them because I was sharing my screen. So um, luckily, I've had coworkers pinging me with uh, certain questions on my phone so I could see them. So I'm so sorry. No. Um, I was hoping I would be able to interject more, but I've been sharing my screen. We've got a lot um, going on. We do have a lot going on. Okay, one quick one last quick question. We're experimenting with AI powered synthetic video to read written testimonials in a branded, beautiful format. Thoughts on this approach? Doesn't sound human to me is my first thought. Mm. Nancy? Well, yeah, that would be the, the A, the artificial, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I had never heard of this before, actually. Uh, so I was like, oh, how interesting. Um, but I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, we're, we're, you said, you know, don't, don't try to be bigger. Don't try to be smaller. Try to be human. So we're trying to be human. And, um, you know, anything that we, you know, inject that, that takes us away from that, that makes us less so is probably not a good thing. That said, I don't know a lot about it. And so I would, of course, reserve judgment until I actually saw it uh, with my own eyes. But just um, in theory, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Sounds like it would be a missed opportunity. I mean, it's synthetic. I don't know. Be, be human, be approachable, be vulnerable. Um, let people just be themselves. Uh, it's like using a stock photo or something. Okay, uberweb.ca. Thank you, thank you first for volunteering. Uh, it was very difficult to narrow them down. We figured this one might be representative of a lot of people. Okay, so at the top of this page, we've got a header. You know what I'm gonna say? You know your, um, oh, this header is actually embedded into the video, so it's gonna change a little bit. You know your business. I get the idea. Uh, and I get the idea behind the looping background video. Uh, we're clearly, uh, this video isn't just arbitrary. It's actually answering a question. It's like, what do these people do? And you can see people working on websites. It kind of looks relevant. I wouldn't say that the video is that, it's sort of, um, it is differentiation because not everybody has an office. Not everyone has these people. You know, this is clearly like a beautiful space. So uh, I understand the logic behind that. About us, services, our work, partners. You might be zoomed in a little bit. It's wrapping. 
but the uh, the those are generic navigation labels common to millions of websites. So I'm not a fan of that. Um, the drop downs are also pretty small. Uh, actually, if you hover over website packages, you're going to see um, something that concerns me. W A A S. Do 100% of our visitors know what that means? That's a question I frequently ask while reviewing sites that we build. What do 100% of our visitors know what that means? If not, kind of a you know it's it's not. Uh, I guess that you know I learned in this case that means website as a service, but it doesn't sound like um, something that's um, going to satisfy an information need of the majority of visitors. It's also one sub nav under. It's a fly out off a drop down, which I don't love for usability. But if I had to guess, the most popular click from this is probably the first hover over about us, and then to go to meet the team. I would bet a beer that this is the most popular page on the website by a, by a mile. Okay, the visual credibility, we didn't see it on the last page. No harm repeating it, Ubisoft. That's nice, I think, to see it there, right? That's visual credibility, which we mentioned. Then scroll down, we have our team. This was actually pushed down farther than I would have expected because the person told us they want to see the team, and we kind of injected other stuff into the field of vision first. Now we're looking at team members, but these, these people don't have their own pages. You can't click to go see these people. If you just uh, maybe search for that person's name. Um, yeah, copy, if you don't mind, Kim, copy and paste that one into Google. Khadija, copy, go to Google, paste that in. Why don't you rank, and LinkedIn ranks number one, followed by Instagram and SoundCloud. Why don't you rank number one for this person's name? It's an SEO trick. <laughs> you make a page per person. You need a page for everything, a page per person, a page per topic, a page for service, a page for all things. This is just sending people away. And if I click to go to LinkedIn, I'm going to see ads. I'm going to see competitors. I'm going to see distractions. I'm going to see notifications. Do you really want your visitor to leave your website and go to a social media site? I'm not a fan. Can you make a page that is arguably as informative as LinkedIn for Alex and Jacob and, and, and Alexander? Yes, you could. Can you make the best page on the internet for each of these people? I think you probably can. So that's a, a, a general tip, make a page per person. But going back, I don't know, let's look at one of these services pages maybe. Uh, pick anyone. Search engine optimization. I know I'm in the right place. Subhead, not as helpful. Drive more traffic to your site with SEO. And then your virtual brochure, sort of three, pay, three of the same sort of headlines. Um, paragraph uh, is... Smaller and blocky, maybe it's helpful though. And if we scroll down, we can see we've got some of the logos. This is where, uh, there's the evidence. 72% of customers who perform a local search visit a store. So that's a data point more than a testimonial. Uh, and then when we keep going, we see, I think these are like, kind of like stock photos. 49%, another data point. Put in quotes, which is interesting. The UB web advantage. So I don't know that this page is answering the top questions that a visitor has when they're considering SEO. Uh, it doesn't look like the images are differentiating you. They're mostly stock photos. Uh, those, those um, actually, if you scroll up a little bit, this is an example of a subheader that I, the Yuba Web Advantage. Uh, I wonder if there isn't a more informative subhead that could be used here or something else. This page also doesn't segment me off if there's more information on one of these topics. There's no sub navigation from here. Um, and as we go down, if you're, so these are, that, that looks like an interesting question. If your site disappears, who, do you, who will you go to, right? That's triggering. That's kind of a triggering question. Nancy, do you have thoughts about that? I like that. Yeah. And no, I thought uh, I, I thought that was a really good question. I, had, I thought they, uh, they had some good frequently asked questions in that section as well. Um, so, so there were definitely, definitely some things that, uh, that jumped out at me that I really liked that, you know, that was, that particular question was one of them. Um, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you. But no, no, I've, got, no. I've got a couple of other thoughts, but finish up and then I'll, I'll chime in. Sure. Uh, let's go to the contact page because I think that's an, this is sort of the money click. Let's say this person has strong intent. Oh, that's interesting. Kim, you're not seeing it. Contact is actually the button. Ironically, it wasn't as visually prominent in this single person use <laughs> usability study, but, but uh, the, the contrast intended to make it more obvious. She had to scan for it for a second. I did. <laughs> wow, fine. real real world uh, you, you, uh, UI A-B testing right now, folks. Uh, got, uh, contact us, I don't think is really a call to action. Get started. We're seeing performing extremely well in tons of A-B tests. We run A-B tests on sites all the time. Uh, get in touch as the header doesn't is sort of a different verb than I just saw. Learn more, again, a different verb than I just saw, and then get in touch again. So we don't really, we're not using a, a consistent action color or button style or, or uh, uh, action word. So it all starts within seconds of your time, fill in the form, 
the, uh, there's no form within my field of vision. The form is farther down below. You actually first asked me to segment myself into one of two groups with the page block above. If you scroll up, so learn more sounds like that's what, learn more is just so generic, guys. One way to scan pages, look, look at the verbs. Ask yourself, is that the strongest verb I can use? Is that the most specific verb I can use? So this is, uh, read the text. Ask if, uh, wondering if we're the right partner for your business, click on the link below to get in touch with your team. So twice you've told me to scroll and click. And, you know, really, if I said contact us, your job is to kind of get everything else out of my way and just give me the form. A little bit strange. Then when you click get in touch, it's going to it's going to launch a, a light box. That's a bit of a disadvantage for analytics, right? Because don't you want to track the visitor as they flow through? So you get a nice funnel visualization report in your conversion section in Google Analytics. You can't really measure the drop off, how many people fill out this form or don't because it's in a pop up. You'd have to do fancy event tracking. This form also doesn't really set any expectations with me about who I might contact and uh, when they'll get back to me. Just for fun, can you please go to one other? I want to show you an example of one that we worked hard on. Blacksmith applications, if you could type that in. Sorry for the long address. Blacksmithapplications.com. Yeah, this is a company that um, manages. Yeah, and go to that. Now click request a demo. This is a minor masterpiece of conversion. Okay, it's the shortest possible form. Get a quick demo. Why would you do this? Because 20,000 other people use this company. What do they use it for? To manage billions of dollars in trade spend. Look at the proof, proof, and then answering a question, right? All I'm doing is evidence and answers. Answer a question, how soon you'll be in touch. And then who might I talk to? Look, it's super specific. We're being human. Does anyone else use this company? Yes. It, Kellogg's uses this company. See, we don't quit selling. <laughs> so this is an example of a page that does a lot of stuff that Ubisoft didn't do, any of which might improve conversion rates and would all be measurable if you have uh, much easier if you have the form on the same page and you can check it all in the, in the funnel visualization report. What are your thoughts, Nancy? Uh, so if we go, if we jump back to uh, UB, I mean, I think you had some great observations and, um, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, there's a lot going on um, that I like about the site. If we go to the, um, the homepage, um, the, uh, I, I like the sentiment about, you know, you know, your business, we know digital, you know, uh, like, you know, let's, let's work together. What I, what troubled me a little bit was it takes a while for this to load. I think it's about 10 seconds before we finally get the, mm -hmm. let's grow together, you know, and I don't know if people are, you know, I mean, we've got some motion to maybe keep people's attention on, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, it takes a while to get to the, the premise, you know, it just takes a little too long to build. But as you scroll down, there's, um, there's a nice subhead. Um, if, if you go down, uh, so a little bit further, uh, you know, your online marketing part, oops. Um, okay. We're in a different place now, I think, but that's okay. Now we're talking about packages and packages is fine. Go, you can go back to the packages and, um, I would suggest testing this. I, I cannot mm. guarantee that it's going to work, but I would I would suggest testing uh, leading on the left with your most expensive, and that becomes mm. your anchor. And then um, you know, th then you kind of work out from there. And, and the you know the five twenty five maybe seems like a lot, but it makes the three eighty eight and the one ninety eight seem a lot more affordable. Whereas when you start with the one ninety eight, you're like, well, okay, maybe I can do that. Ooh. 388. No, I'm not going to go there, you know. But if you see 528 and then you see the 388, you're like, oh, well, that's a heck of a lot better than the 528. So I think that's definitely something worth uh, testing. You know, uh, kind of changing your price anchors. Right now, you're kind of anchoring with a low one. The first first price people see, that's what they're going to evaluate everything else against. So you're, you've got a low anchor. If you have a high anchor, you yeah. might end up seeing, uh, you know, an increase in uh, in your premium uh, sales. So I thought that would be that would be something um, worth testing. Um, uh, one of the thought there, I mean, unsure, talk to Kevin, picture of Kevin, right? Because uh, this is just all we can do from there is learn more. But that person might be uh, have high intent at this scroll depth and maybe they're ready for a call. Right. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Uh, just below this, there's a, a kind of a social proof marker, which is nice, you know, over, uh, you know, uh, a thousand mm -hmm. businesses who trust us. And, you know, that word trust is always really, really good. There was a, I think there was a study that indicated um, closing a sales pitch with you can trust us with your business actually increased uh, the likelihood of closing the business. Mm -hmm. That Just that idea of you can trust us with your business, because I think, Andy, as you were saying, you know, that's what people are wondering. They're on your site. They're trying to answer a need. And one of the questions they're, you know, that's on their mind is, 
are these the people for me? Can I trust them with my business? Can I trust they'll get it done? Can I trust they'll treat me well? You know, so being able to mention that I think is a very good thing. Um, on the on the home page, uh, you know, we had the the you know the uh, the video and the and then if you go down a little bit uh, right below it, so yeah, right here, your online marketing partner disrupting the online world one business at a time. I like that line, disrupting the online world one business at a time. And I was like, yeah, it's a little. I, I think there's some impact there and maybe that could be celebrated more maybe you know made it uh, make it a little bit bigger and, and have more prominence and then i read the copy block beneath it and that's where i got to this idea that um you guys are offering subscriptions uh to save mm -hmm. people money mm -hmm. and i said gee if, if that really is kind of the big you know the big news here the thing that makes you different than some of your competitors the thing that's helping you disrupt the the industry maybe that should have more prominence too so it's not simply that you know I know my business and you guys know digital and together we're going to grow. It's that you've got a different way for, for us to grow a way that's going to help me save money as I, uh, you know, start to, uh, get my message out on digital. So, um, so if that is really something that's more unusual, that's more differentiating, I, I think I would make that more prominent. Uh, you know, it, I think it's something that you could pop more I, unless you tell me, you know what, all of our competitors have it. We're just, it's just, you know, we're just saying it, but it's not really true. And if that's the case, you shouldn't be saying it if it's not really true. I totally agree. Look, they're the smallest things at this scroll depth, all inclusive subscription packages. See that? It's the last line in that little paragraph, center line paragraph. That probably should be the, uh, the subhead at the scroll depth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, it's like, Hey, yeah. we're going to, we're going to save you money. We're going to make your cost predictable. And you know, if you're a small to mid-sized business, that could be a very compelling sales point. Mm -hmm. So maybe do a little bit more with it. Um, Paul's got a great question. What would you recommend instead of services or about there is no replacement for about about is a special unique page. It's a page that people go to when they want to hear you talk about yourself. It's the one page that's supposed to be self-centered and was written from a very different tone, but services is often a missed opportunity to, to, to just add a word or two that indicates the service itself. Great for search, great for visitors. Digital marketing services, SEO, website development services. Um, it's uh, services by itself is just um, isn't specific enough. If you want, if you're running out of horizontal space and you want top, you want horizontal navigation. Maybe you can move some of the other stuff up higher into the secondary navigation. They sometimes call that the highbrow. Uh, we've got maybe just enough time for one more quick example. I texted that or I chatted that to you. It's uh, Anna Cahill Creative. Um, another one that Nancy, you said you liked, you and I reviewed some of these together, uh, just comes across as very different. This is a, it, it's an awesome example in a way, because this is the very human approach to web design. Uh, it's got a pop-up window. Uh, that is a bit of friction that's early in the process. It's asking me to, to convert into a kind of a content, um, a, it's a content conversion. It's, to, it's to subscribe. Uh, I love the specificity here. 31 days of content ideas. Cool. Like that's uh, specificity again. Specificity correlates with conversion. Uh, although the homepage here now, what if I want to hire you? Like it's um, you know, I would only leave that there if it seems to be converting pretty well. So probably most visitors will close that. Um, this is uh, Anna's personal brand is pushed so far forward here. Uh, Nancy, do you think that's too much? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I um. This is one of the ones that I, I was excited to talk about because as soon as you, you hit the homepage, you get a definite aesthetic, you, you get a definite sense and a feeling and you're like, okay, and that, that's good. That's working for, uh, before it's working for Anna Cahill, but what might be working against Anna Cahill is it's difficult to read. Uh, white type on a, on a mm -hmm. light gray background is very hard to read. White type over a visual is hard to read. Uh, and and a, a small point size is also hard to read. And, and unfortunately, all of that is present here. And um, so it, you know, it makes me think a little bit of balance between owning the aesthetic, but, but making it easier to access. Because when I land here, I want to say, okay, I'm in the right place. And, and it's hard for me to read that to even confirm that I am. And there are some studies that, that indicate that if it's hard for you to read something, you're going to assume that what you've read about is hard to do. So mm -hmm. if I'm having a hard time reading the homepage, I might leap to the idea that working with you guys is, is going to be difficult. And, and that's not a leap that Anna Cahill is going to want me to make, you know? So, mm -hmm. And then I was like, uh, getting back to Andy, your question about, is this for me? I got a, a heavy um, fashion vibe. I'm like, ooh, you know, I bet you it's, you know, she's really specializing in fashion. And then when I found the, um, the logos of some of the clients, which was not on the home page, I don't, oh, there they go, what, what, what clients say. Um, some of them 
Okay, and those are those are actually testimonials. There's another page, I think the about page that actually includes the client logos, and um, I think there there was at least one that was a fashion one. But uh, these here, yeah, many of them were entertainment radio stations, you know, mm -hmm. and then some of them um, uh, were were logos that I didn't recognize, and so I was like, okay, so I don't have to be fashion. I wouldn't necessarily have guessed this was the, the place for a radio station to go to, but apparently it is, you know, and then there are some of these others like that kind of upside down peace sign. I don't know who they are. Maybe it's just me, but um, maybe they're very popular. And I think Tennessee is where she's located, but um, you know, but again, trying to, to convey to people, you're in the right place. Yeah. Make it I really agree. obvious, you know, that, okay. Yeah. I don't have to be a yeah. high end fashion uh, brand, but we saw good social proof. We saw yes. specificity. We saw there was a, there's a lot of things that, uh, yeah, see the numbers, the numbers there. Uh, it's very human and personal because it's got, uh, she's all over the place. I, I think that um, shorter paragraphs would help. Some yeah. of these oh. feel a bit blocky. There's the, I, I would, as a rule, never write a paragraph longer than three lines. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be our last tip, but we just hit the top of the hour. Kim, how are we doing? <laughs> we did. I was just about to interject and say, I'm so sorry uh, for all the technical difficulties, uh. but it was still a great co like conversation. Lots of great questions coming through. Stick around, folks. We are heading right into our next talk. I want to thank Andy, Nancy. You two are amazing. Uh, Again, follow these people, folks. They are incredible. And stick around for our very next talk. But otherwise, Andy, Nancy, and I are going to say bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Duda. Take care. Have a great conference, everybody. You have tons of great stuff in store. Thanks so much. There's great stuff coming up. Great stuff. Thanks, everybody. Happy Tuesday, all. <laughs> Happy Hello. Tuesday. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, what a good way to start the week. Yeah, we're 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 digging out of some 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 blizzard weather up here in uh in Canada, but we're we're almost out of it. And we're used blizzard. to it, of course. Oh, that sounds like fun. How many inches of snow did you get? Uh According to my measurements in the backyard, it was it was about 13, 13 inches. Oh my goodness! It was a good one, Ali. You probably got some of that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit further north, so I think we got pretty much the <clears> same. <throat> Get some lake effect, lots of snow. Not my favorite season to be in Canada, that's for sure. <laughs> eh, I'll just make you jealous. It's seventy yeah. degrees. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Eric. Yep, we know we're on. <laughs> we're waiting for Anton here. All right, well, I'll just get started then. How's that? Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dudacon. We are live. So uh, today, what we're going to be going over is, is I don't, well, actually, I'm, I'll start off here. I'm joined by Colin Nielsen, Allie Markson, and Dana Luciano. And uh, they're going to introduce themselves here in a second. But today we're going to be going over basically what we saw in 2021 with local SEO and Google My Business or Google My Biz Google Business Profile, as now called. Um, also, we're going to be talking about some of the results of the local ranking survey. And then we're going to jump into 2022 predictions. So that's going to be the fun part. Where do we think things are going to be going? Um, so with that, I want to allow everybody to go ahead and introduce themselves. Colin, let's go ahead and get started with you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, my name's Colin. Uh, I'm the Vice President Local Search at Sterling Sky, and I've uh, been doing local SEO since 2010. And um, yeah, just just absolutely love it. Um, I'm a part of the, the Product Experts program with Ben, and uh, also love kind of doing that and just helping out business, business owners over at the Google My Business Forum. And uh, yeah, outside of this, uh, just love to, to try and stay fit and um, you know keep, keep the brain sharp so you can uh, stay sharp with with the craziness that's the changing world of uh, local SEO. Definitely on the staying fit part. I know you take uh, what is it Taekwondo? No. Uh, well, before the pandemic was uh, was training uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for 
BJJ, uh, that's years. right. Got my blue belt, uh, but it's been pretty uh, hit and miss for the last year, let's say. <laughs> right on. Well, cool. Thanks, Colin. Appreciate it, man. Uh, Dana, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Lucio from Amps of Digital. I'm an SEO strategist there, and my focus is primarily on local SEO. I have about seven years in the SEO industry, and the last four to five have been hyper-focused on local um, with my experience in you know small local businesses, multi-location, all the way to you know huge franchises across the country. Um, some of the industries that I've worked in have been um, home care, health and fitness, wellness and beauty, healthcare, and you know, like home repair, all kind of ran the gamut on that. Um, and I'm currently in Nashville right now, so terrible. Go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dana. I appreciate it. And happy you're here. And Allie, please introduce yourself to yeah, those who hello. don't know you already. <laughs> Yeah, hi everybody. I'm so glad you're here today. My name is Ali Margison. I'm the director of SEO at WhiteSpark. WhiteSpark is a Canadian company based in Edmonton, Alberta, and we develop um, software for agencies to use to track their local rankings, um, to build their reputation online, and then we also offer services. We offer a listing service to build citations for businesses, um, from small businesses to big multi-location, um, and we have a Google business profile management service and website, sort of local SEO service, um, and that's kind of where I fit in. Um, I lead that team of Google business profile experts. Um, and yeah, I've been in local SEO for probably the past six or so years and in digital marketing since 2014. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Ali. So, and I'll just introduce myself really quick. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Fisher. I'm with Steady Demand. Um, I've been a Google product expert, uh, not as long as Colin has, uh, but I think now it's eight years, six or eight years, something like that. Um, I'm a Google, my, uh, Google Business Profile Diamond product expert, uh, which is a lot of fun because I get to help out a lot of people and, of course, engage with Google. My company, Steady Demand, we focus on Google Business Profiles as well as local SEO. So we handle everything from GBP, I still hate saying that, Colin, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> management and optimization. Uh, we also do like a lot of reinstatements from suspensions type of work. And we also do local SEO, just general local SEO audits and on site. Um, me, myself, I've been doing this probably since uh, 1994. Technically, I say 1996 because between 94 and 96, there was no such thing as local SEO. Um, and so, yeah, but I've uh, worked with enterprises as well as franchises and also a lot of smaller businesses as well. So that's me. That's in a nutshell. And let's dig straight into it. All right. So let's get started with the 2021 highlights. What did we see in 2021 that we thought was kind of the most interesting? And um, Colin, I'm going to actually lead this one off with you. Sterling Sky did a great study towards the end of the year. We had it, I think that it was between November 28th and, and December 8th is when the vicinity update truly hit. Um, I know a lot of our clients, well, a couple of our clients are hearing, are seeing it. And I know you have a lot of information about that. So could you tell us a little bit about the vicinity update and its impacts? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so like I said, Ben, it, it, the, the date range for this, this update was uh, like last day of December and it went till November, or sorry, last day of November, it went till December 8th. And um, like we would say, it's probably like the biggest local algorithm specific update in, in at least the last five years. And uh, it seemed to, to mostly be about proximity as a ranking factor and, and sort of that being dialed up as a ranking factor. Uh, so, so one of the interesting things is um, you need to be using uh, one of these like new style geo grid rank trackers in order to have like really been able to visualize what happened with this update. Um, so like if you're still using one of those rank trackers that, that just uh, tracks from one single sort of searcher location, uh, you could have easily missed or, or just overlooked this update. But what would happen is if you had somebody, if you looked at their ranking report across their entire market, let's say it was all you know, twos and threes, and, and they ranked um, for, for quite a big radius, it shrunk after this update. Um, so uh, the other really interesting thing about this update is um, it, it seems to have had a, a more dramatic impact on implicit 
keywords. Uh, so keywords that, that do not have a like a city modifier versus, uh, you know, just personal injury lawyer on its own. Um, so, so that was another like big lesson is like you, you always want to be tracking both of, of those versions, um, especially for when, when stuff like this happens, these big updates. Yep, I completely agree. I personally love the grid trackers. I mean, ever since this update, our clients, we've been, uh, they've been talking about opening up new locations, which is, goes along with our predictions. And it's one of the things, the first things we say is you use grid tracker, look for fall off, and then start planning where you want to pop up a new location at that point. So, um, Ali, you have anything that you'd like to add to this? Um, regarding vicinity or just another update? Uh, regarding vicinity. Let's just go, let's hang out here for a moment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit when I talk about the local search ranking factors, but um, I definitely okay. think the vicinity update is totally going to um, rock a few of those factors for um, next year's survey. Um, some big change to um, not just the, the proximity, but also um, keywords in the business name and, and how important that is. And then obviously that has implications for spam fighting. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that works. Um, we didn't have too many clients that we saw major changes with, um, but I think lawyers definitely um, were impacted by this. I read a poll that multi-location businesses are impacted by this. So definitely worth checking your rankings um, in, you know, all around your, your main location to see what sort of impact there was. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, uh, we didn't see, like I said, a ton of people get hit with this. And the interesting thing was, is it was across different types of verticals. It wasn't just personal injury. However, with the keyword aspect of things, what we have found out is, is that it's not a hard, fast rule that keywords are being affected inside of the business name because we're still seeing a lot of areas where it's actually still working. Mm -hmm. So um, is there a hint of things to come? Who knows, you know? <laughs> so at least it's not that devastating yet. Um, how about you, Dana? What have you been seeing with the vicinity update? Um, kind of the same as Ali said, we haven't really seen many clients be impacted, but I definitely agree, you know, having some kind of regulations more around keyword stuffing in the name, I think is beneficial for users. Um, and I think proximity and is important for users as well. And I think the update makes sense. Cool. Awesome. Well, with that, we'll move on to the next thing that happened in 2021. Um, this is an update seven years, I guess you could say in the making, there hasn't been a major name change for Google local places plus uh, now Google Business <laughs> Profile, GMP, now Google Business Profile Manager or whatever, Google Business Profile. Uh, so the big thing was is that there was actually a name change for Google My Business. Um, there are a lot of people still fighting it, but it's actually accelerating very at a, at a very interesting pace about how many people are actually calling it Google Business Profile now. So... Um, so yeah, so that is kind of interesting. And along with that, we also got uh, basically kind of almost a full parody rollout of the Google Business Profile in search experience, where, you know, obviously for the past year, we've been able to kind of do this, but the, all the features weren't out there now. And I think the only thing that's missing right now, Colin, is what the website, basically, GMB website, but that's not even gonna change too much. Um, so, <clears throat> but anyway, so those two things actually occurred and um, that I didn't expect it. I thought it was kind of interesting that they did it and why they did it in the first place. And we're just going to start off with Ali. What do you think about GMB to GBP and the in-search experience reaching almost full parity? Yeah, um, I haven't really used the in-search experience much, but I think that's because I'm working from an agency. I think that it's really beneficial to business owners. It's kind of, you know, intuitive. Um, and I think that the change from Google My Business to Google Business Profile was sort of a long time coming, I guess. I mean, like you said, they've changed it so many times, even over the past 10 years. It's gone through a lot of um, different iterations. But, um, but yeah, I think that, you know, they were doing this, prepping for this for a long time, all of the support documents would refer to it as a profile. So I think in like the sort of small community of local SEO, we're always calling them GMB listings, but Google hasn't really been using that terminology. They've been calling them Google business profiles in their own you know documents for a long time. So I don't know, we just got to adapt and start using that. Um, yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. You know, we had a question actually here, just I want to back up before we can move on to this. Uh, Mike Dupella was asking, what is a grid tracker? You know, and Ali, I'm going to go ahead. You guys are the search kings here as far <laughs> as reports go. So uh, can you tell us, tell uh, Mike yes. what a grid tracker is? Yeah, so traditional rank tracker will track um, for the keywords that you choose and the locations that you choose. And so a, a grid tracker basically puts this on a map. So you'd see the Google map and then overlaid, you're going to see pinpoints um, for different points of search. And so what's nice about that type of a rank tracker is that you're not just looking you know, at your business's location where you're probably going to rank well. Um, you're not looking at you know checking your rankings from just Googling it at home where you live an hour away and you don't seem to be ranking at all, this type of rank tracker is going to show you specifically how you rank at different points on a grid. And so um, the visual of it, basically, if you imagine a map overlaid, you're going to have these different points and it'll show you, you know, one for ranking in first position, five for ranking in fifth position and so on. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. All right. And with that, hey, Lily, how's it going? Um, Dana, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about GMB to GBP and the GBP in search experience? I, I think it's mostly like the name change is just going to be something that us in the industry are going to have to get used to. Um, I'm sure we'll trip through it multiple times um, as just getting used to it. But it's, again, just another change, you know, going from plus to business was a change and it's just something we kind of have to get used to. Um, and then I don't really use the search experience. Again, I work in an agency, so we use the agency dashboards yes. a lot. Um, but I definitely think it's going to be something that business business owners will be able to utilize. You know, one thing I just want to really uh, pipe in really quickly about this whole uh, the name change and the in search experience is that you know there, there's a good myth I should say <laughs> going on out there ever since the change, thinking that the agency dashboard is going to kind of go away for those who have like one to three um, profiles. And that's not true. There's really can't get into the details on this, but um, there's gonna be something rolling out very shortly that kind of makes the management experience a little bit more e easier for those people. But you're right, as agencies, we've got a lot of profiles. So um, so we're gonna be continuing to use the, the dashboard for a long time, basically at this point. Um, Colin, what about you, man? What do you think? I don't, don't, don't have anything to add, actually. Um, I, I echo the sentiments there. I, I don't use it a ton for the same reason that sort of um, Ali mentioned. We just manage so many listings that uh, it's just not super conducive to be going out and editing things in search, but definitely see where Google is going with it. I understand it. And like anything else, we would just have to adapt to it. It's just yeah. a matter of time. And for those large amounts of percentage of single merchant uh, profile owners, I mean, it makes total sense for them. I mean, it's kind of echoes their behavior. Cool. With that, uh, let's see, no questions about that. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and move over to the GMB Insights. Colin, you had some stuff to say about this. Yeah, it was just one of my favorite things that, that Google up, upgraded, uh, let's say, in 2021. So they, they just made... Uh, it looks like it's still in progress. Like if you go into your Google business profile dashboard um, and you go to the insights tab and you, you kind of go to the top, there's that little like block where you can click uh, see performance and you click on that. And what's really nice now is they, they sort of give you this, uh, whether you're looking at phone call data, clicks to the website, uh, there's a few other metrics in there. You can see it plotted out over like a six month period, which, it, which is wonderful. And then you can, uh, let's say you just want to understand what's happening in a particular month, you can sort of double click on that month and then it'll give you additional insight like um, how does this compare year over year to the same month the year before, uh, which can be really insightful. Uh, and they, they kind of highlight it nice in the report so you can do a nice screenshot, send it off as, as an email or a report uh, to a client if you want to communicate that. So I just love seeing Google investing uh, like money into this like local level data uh, so continuing to do that um, and you know even if the call the call data so so the report on how many calls your your listing got even though it's not super accurate in the sense that it's only recording data 
somebody clicking from like click to call from a mobile device, uh, it can highlight these like really cool trends. So you can see like over time, are my calls going up, are they going down? Oh, they dipped this month. Let's let's investigate and see see what happened there. So I think we will continue to to make more investments into the uh, insights and and really hopefully start to get like really granular with with like local level data on an ongoing basis. I completely agree, you know, <clears throat> and the other thing about the year over year, it's not only can you double click on the month, but you can actually click on a series of months. So you could click on November and December and see the year over year for that period. So that's great for seasonal businesses, right? Yep. Cool. Excellent. Uh, Allie, Dana, anything you would like to talk about as far as the insights? No, I hope the same that they continue to expand on those and we can get more data so we can make better data driven decisions from those profiles. And maybe we'll get Google analytics integration maybe. one day, right? <laughs> Not holding my breath on that one. All right. So let's see. Uh, okay. So Ali, let's talk about the local pack and what happened with that. Yeah, local pack got a glow up in 2021. Um, it looked um, pretty much the same for I think a couple of years now. Um, and so the local pack that we're talking about that's at the top of the search results, if um, if local businesses are a reasonable search result for that, um, you'll see the local pack, which is um, a little snap of Google Maps and then typically three listings. Um, and so these are Google business profiles that are related to the search term. Um, I've got a screenshot of that later on. I'll show you guys um, to clear that up. But um, but yeah, the local pack saw a change in 2021. Now we typically see it with the map off to the right, three businesses, still typically three um, on the left. It just looks a lot nicer. Um, and then, you know, still same functionality, although um, the map does seem to be sort of more honed in. And I think that's just since the vicinity update um, as we're looking at businesses that are in closer proximity for a lot of searches. Uh, definitely, I agree. And last year, there were some interesting experiments that happened actually with layout. You know, I mean, I think at one point we saw a 10 pack. Yeah. <laughs> um, we saw an infinite scroll as well, you know, so they, they definitely keep on, keep on experimenting. It was kind of interesting testing. how they decided to settle on that though, you know, but hey, it okay. is what it is. Uh, Dana, Kellen, anything? No, I like to see the test. I like to see, you know, the continuous um, you know, the photos thing was kind of interesting um, when they were pulling photos in that local pack. Um, I haven't seen that recently, but, you know, I like seeing the test and kind of seeing what sticks. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we actually have a question. So from Greg, uh, I'm not going to try to answer your last, your, say your last name there, Greg. Greg V. Um, basically, he's asking, what do we think of Google adding services by default and allowing them to click edit and remove selected ones? Uh, the keywords are auto added, yes, to the Google business profile, basically to services. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll answer that one really quickly. And basically, that was Google's way of just trying to get merchants to add more services to their Google business profiles. They do this every once in a while, especially in the service uh, category or industry, well, whatever you want a vertical. And, um, so it, it's not going to affect your ranking. Um, you know, it's something that's visual more than anything else. Well, not visual. I'm sorry. It's informational. So I wouldn't be too worried about it. You should be able to just remove them and they should go away for good. They should not come back unless that information is somehow tied kind of semantically on your site, then that could cause them to kind of pop back in. Uh, at that point, you got to kind of track it down and fix it. Um, Ali, you're shaking your head a lot. Anything you yes. like to say about this? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I, we saw this happen. I think it was like mid year. This started to happen a lot and absolutely what are, it's pulling the information from, from like everything that we've seen in the, the businesses we looked at It's absolutely pulling semantically related words from the website. And so sometimes you get these really, really weird services that are like, I can see how that's related to this business, but like that's not a service we offer. Um, and so we just go in and we edit down those lists to the proper services. But I think that having your services 
it's super important and I can understand why Google is trying to pull these in. If business owners aren't going to go in and optimize that themselves, um, definitely go in and, and manage your services and add them because they can be pulled in justifications. Um, and these show up in a ton of local packs. They show up in local finder. And so that's just a little snippet from um, your services. It starts with um, this bold text that says provides um, and then it'll have information that it's pulling directly from services. So definitely it's worthwhile to get keywords in there and just try to filter out any of the weird stuff Google's pulling in. I mean, they're just pulling it in, you know, automatically in machine learning. So there's bound to be a few mistakes there. Exactly. This is why we say fill in all the things when it comes to your Google yeah. business profile or Google's going to do it for you. Yep. <laughs> Remember services when they changed that from, you know, from a radius to zip codes <laughs> and they just stuck mm -hmm. them in there for people. Yeah. Um, Colin, you got anything on this? Uh, nothing to add really. Just, I think we're going to talk more about justifications and I think it'll come up, but I mean, in relationship to services, I mean, that's in my opinion, the most important part of them is that they do get pulled in to glow up. Uh, and I love that by the way. Uh, the three pack and just just it's like these nice little bells and whistles. Um, so, so make sure if you're thinking about services, you're mainly thinking about them in terms of how they're going to show up as justifications. Right. Not a ranking factor. <laughs> yeah. All right. And Dana, let's cap off the 2021 highlights. You have a bunch of stuff you want to talk about with knowledge panel changes. Let's do it. Yeah, mine was just kind of, you know, looking at how the local knowledge panel has changed and, you know, just like listings have really gotten a lot of new features this year. Um, you know, we we're just talking about justifications. I think the, you know, if, even though they're not completely new, the increase of them, I think is really beneficial for businesses. You know, we're pulling in service justifications, you know, the products that are sold here, menu highlights for restaurants. Um, even review justifications. And I think having those on the profile is really beneficial, especially from a user standpoint. Um, so that was kind of a big thing. Another thing that I think was really beneficial is for healthcare businesses, having the option to add, you know, we take this insurance provider, I think is huge. And if, you know, you're a healthcare business and you have that option and you're not doing that, I think that's a missed opportunity, um, especially because that makes sense as a user, like in your buyer journey, you know, if it's not, somewhere on your website or, you know, on your profile, when they call, that's probably gonna be the first question that comes up is like, do you take the insurance I, you know, provide? So I think that's a really beneficial thing that Google's rolled out, um, as well as just kind of, you know, increasing kind of how reviews are shown um, within justifications, you know, how they're adding the new label on there, um, sentiment and reviews, I think are again, more and more things that are Kind of just showing us what Google's looking for. Um, and I think that's going to have a huge, you know, we'll talk about it towards the end, but I think that's going to have a huge kind of, you know, impact on next year and kind of where we're going with local. Yep. And I mean, they even did things like, for instance, including odor, owner information if it was present on the website. So, you know, they're continuing yeah. to scrape and, and show more information that they feel is valuable to the consumer if they need to make a decision or find some kind of information, you know, and that is their job at the end of the day. So um, yeah, it's lots of exciting things. Definitely lots of exciting things. All right, cool. With that, we're gonna jump over and Ali, why don't you walk us through the local ranking survey and we can all talk about that here for a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Just gonna share my screen. Um, so I brought some slides and I see some questions, you know, about like what justifications are. Um, so hopefully this slide deck, um, since I can include some visuals, I'll be able to show you the local pack we were talking about. Um, I'll also be able to show you what justifications look like and a few other things. Um, but yeah, so basically I'll just go through and present the results of um, White Sparks 2021 local search ranking factors survey, um, present some highlights that I found in it, and then maybe after we'll you know, chat through anything, or do you guys want to jump in? Whatever works for, for you guys. I think we should all just interrupt you as you're going, Allie. Okay. Just saying. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is it. Um, Whitespark.ca slash LSRF. Um, you can access the full study there. 
this year's report, super informative um, as to what's going on in local SEO and what um, we determined to be these ranking factors. Um, but this year, it's just super beautiful. Um, talk about glow up. This thing looks great this year. Um, so you can navigate through. We've got six sections um, and you can read the full commentary from every one of the experts who participated in this um, study. And so this year, we surveyed over 40 experts in local search. There they are. Um, ben and Colin were part of this. And and uh, Lily from AMSIV Digital was part of this as well. All right, so um, the ranking factors are divided into these two categories. Um, and the first is local pack or finder rankings, and the other is organic rankings. So I'll show you what we found. First of all, we'll focus on local pack and finder rankings, and I'll kind of define what that is. So here's that, that local pack um, that got the glow up. Um, so this is what it looks like now. Um, it's featured on many search result pages. It's usually at the top or very near to the top of the results. Um, it'll include, like I said, this small map um, and generally the top three of the um, top three ranking local businesses for the search term. Um, so all of these results here, they're not web pages. These are Google business profiles. Um, so when you click the more businesses button that you see there, it'll navigate you over to the local finder. And this is what the local finder looks like. Um, so this is Google Maps with all of the relevant businesses ranking for that search term. So just to be clear, that's what we're talking about when we're looking at these specific ranking factors. It's the local pack and the local finder. So here they are. Um, the ranking factors are broken into seven different themes. Um, over a third of them, 36%, were um, Google business profile factors. Another 17% were Google review factors, 16% were on page, 13% link, and then the rest is just split between behavioral, citation, and personalization factors. And so these are the themes that we break all of the different factors into. Um, so let's see here. Um, we've been conducting this survey for several years now, and you can see the weighting for these seven themes has changed um, over the past eight years in this, um, in this graph here. This year, Google My Business or Google Business Profile reviews and on-page factors became even more important. All right, so here they are. I'm not going to go through the entire thing, so it might be a good opportunity to grab a screenshot if you want to save this, but you can always access um, this chart at whitespark.ca slash LSRF. So these are the top 20 local pack and finder factors according to industry experts. Um, so you can see them all here. Um, each factor is given a composite score, which is aggregated from how the contributors create their own top 20 rankings. So every contributor will put in how they think the, the factors rank, they'll do their own top 20, and then we just aggregate that to create this um, composite data here. So the number one local pack um, and finder factor is primary GMB category. Um, it's followed by keywords in the business title and proximity to point of search, which we kind of touched on when um, Colin was sharing about the vicinity update. And I'll talk about those factors in a minute, too. Anybody you want to jump in on anything there? I just had a, an observation, and this jumped out at me earlier today um, on that slide you were just on there, Ali. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I, th I think this is important. Um, if you look at the first um, four, the, and, and then you look at the, I think it was called the composite score. Uh, yeah. Right the there we go. So if you look at the first four, it's really interesting. The composite score is between like 538 for the fourth one up to 652. Uh, and then there's like this really sharp uh, drop off when you go from four to five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so i'm not 100 percent sure what to make of that but i do think that's really important that there if, if you look at all these factors there's four that like really shine um and not that everything else isn't important but there is that really interesting sharp, sharp drop off after, mm -hmm. after number four yeah and if you notice next to it we've also got um this year the number of participants who um agreed um on ranking that one so i think that's where we see this this drop off uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah over 30 of the participants you know would agree on these top ones and then it sort of drops down and and people start you know putting things in other rankings for sure hmm. all right so um yeah, so the next thing is the local organic ranking factors. So again, just to be really clear, what do we mean when we say organic search results? These are them here. They're the links 
um, pages that Google indexes and is relating to the search term. So these results are typically located just below any ads, a local pack if it's relevant to the search term, um, and any other you know, new features, um, you'll see these organic search results here. Okay, so the ranking factor is again broken into the same seven themes, but it's pretty different here. Um, you can see the themes are weighted pretty differently. 34% of the top local organic ranking factors are on-page factors. 31% are link factors. Um, the rest is split between the other five categories. So here they are, top 20 local organic ranking factors according to the industry experts that we surveyed. Um, again, good opportunity to take a screenshot if you want to save that information, but you can always get it on WhiteSpark's website, whitespark.ca slash LSRF. So that's like a really quick overview of what we found, but um, I wanted to just give my own highlights. Darren Shaw, um, the founder of WhiteSpark, he creates this study, and um, obviously it's information gathered from, like I said, over 40 experts. Um, and here's what I thought was really interesting this year. I was asked for five to 10 highlights, and I'm like, if I could have done seven and a half, I would have, but I did seven. <laughs> so here we go. The first thing is new and noteworthy. Um, we added it an on-page factor this year, internal linking. So internal linking is not news. Um, it is an important strategy, has been for a long time, but it was just missing from our survey. So it's noteworthy that this was added in 2021 to the local search ranking factors. And uh, experts agree it's important. It already is um, ranking in the number 18 spot for local organic ranking factors. So the lesson here really is to make sure that your website has a strong internal linking strategy, which means looking for opportunities to make meaningful links between different pages in your site. You know, can the homepage where you mention different services, can you link to a page for that service, for example? Next up, I'm sure Ben will have thoughts about this one. I'm calling it the contentious topic from the 2021 <laughs> study, uh, spam fighting. Now, I say um, it was a contentious topic, and I'm excited to see how it changes in the survey next year. But um, we asked the experts, what are you focusing more on in 2021? And then in the top three factors of what they are spending more time on, focusing more on was this removal of spam listings through spam fighting. Um, and while this factor got enough votes to make it onto the list of like what's hot, uh, it actually showed up in the commentary. There were so many notes about how it's less effective, how it's more time consuming. It's getting, uh, somebody said it's getting pointless. Carrie Hills said that, I love that. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of funny. It shows up in what we were focusing more on, but everybody's giving extreme hate to the spam fighting process, so. Um, you know what the funny part about that is, Ellie? So is like, I, I looked in our system just last night because I, I figured this might come up. Mm -hmm. We're still hovering 65% removal rates. So I don't know what you all are talking about. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I noticed your review went in the commentary here <laughs> when I was looking through it, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the tactic of spam fighting really depends on the industry you're in, um, yeah. the type of spam that you're dealing with. Um, I mean, it's, it is time consuming because it's not just your own efforts. You have to, you know, work on submitting redressal forms and evidence to Google and waiting on Google support. So I can see how people's patience is, you know, getting a little thin here, but, but yeah, definitely depends on the business and the type of spam you're dealing with. So it's interesting to see the contention here. <laughs> All right, so next one, um, we talked about this already, vicinity update. Um, so these are factors that I think we're going to be, they're gonna reflect on the next study as just being like really rocked by the vicinity update. So that's proximity of address to the point of searcher and keywords in the GMB title. So proximity of address to the point of the searcher, really what that means is how close is the business to the searcher. Um, and that's really increased in importance since the vicinity update, no doubt why uh, it has been so named. Um, and then a welcome change, although as we said earlier, this isn't you know widespread. Um, keywords in the GMB business title should have less weight um, after this update, but like Ben said, not in every, um, not in every category. Um, I also think that the vicinity update affects 
your spam fighting strategy. So if you are a by the books business that was combating unfair spam in the maps, but then those businesses with the keyword stuff names are now going to get less prominence, well then your spam fighting burden may have just gotten lighter. When we're doing spam fighting, we always tell people to focus on the businesses that are ranking them. You're not just going to you know, vigilante and go after every listing. Focus where it's going to actually bring your business benefit. And so if some of those listings are now getting um, lower, are ranking lower than you, well now they're off of your, your hit list for sure. Um, and then just, I know we talked about it already, but um, if you want more information about the vicinity update, the Sterling Sky blog is where you can read all about that. Excellent. And the Sterling Sky blog is a place where you can get excellent content too, I'm just saying. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and the White Spark. I'm sorry, the White Spark and Sterling Sky blog, actually. Both. Yeah. Cool. So um, awesome. Thank you, Allie. Really appreciate you doing all of that. Um, I know I enjoy participating in the study every single year. So, and uh, it's a real, I think it's amazing, actually, what Darren and y'all have done with that. So it's just, uh, it's really, it's a lot of fun. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, with that, I guess we'll go over to Dana. Do you have anything that you would like to add about the local ranking factor study? No, I I'm really like actually seeing internal linking show up there because it's such an SEO kind of you know staple, and I think sometimes it's underrated and people aren't using it enough. Great, Colin. Uh, I'll add on to that. And I, I think there's definitely some emphasis that should be applied there. And the way that <clears throat> Ali, you, <clears throat> the way that you said it, it is exactly how I think from a local SEO perspective, you should think about internal linking, which is like very strategic. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not like you're just looking at the entire website and thinking like structurally, how is the entire site fit together? Although, although that is important. Um, but it's more like, okay, I have an opportunity to, to get into the three pack or increase rankings for X, Y, Z keywords. How can I improve that through internal linking with really good anchor text, connecting certain pages together on a case by case basis? Um, I think that's where it becomes really potent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, internal links are just, it's an excellent way for you to kind of guide and inform the, the algorithm as to the context of what you're talking about. So if I'm talking about a local ranking factor study and I have a local ranking factor study on my site and I say, yeah, you should read the local ranking factor study because of X or because of this piece of information, um, then it just gives more context to Google and therefore can search better uh, organic results because of that. I only thought one thing that was interesting and the one thing I wanted to note on there that was I thought was interesting was for the local organic there's so many that participated that referenced GMB as a ranking factor for organic mm -hmm. the other way around. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Right. GMB sort of showed up in that like low percentage for organic, but I feel like the thing that's kind of a crossover between the two is um, on page and links. Both of those were pretty important. You know, those were after GMB and reviews, which are obviously kind of your bread and butter for ranking local pack, local finder, then it was on page and links. And then those are the top things for local organic. So I feel like if you're wondering where to put your budget, where to put your time, that's a good place to start. Agreed, agreed. Well, cool. Before we get into 2022 predictions, uh, we just have a couple questions here that people have asked. So we'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, Eric Camilleri has asked, if we have witnessed any impact related to core web vitals for local businesses in 2021. Uh, I'll leave that one off really quickly. So core web vitals is basically more of a tiebreaker than anything else. So if you are going to rank for something and Ali is going to rank for something and it's almost exact as far as the algorithm it depends to seize it, well, if you're ranking for Core Web Vitals, then whoever has a better Core Web Vitals score is usually going to win. Um, but speaking of, Allie, do you have any thoughts on Core Web Vitals? You know, I don't have too much that I would add to that. Um, you know, we're focusing so much on like the GMB factors in, in my department. And so Core Web Vitals, we've got actually Tomas on my team. He is producing an article where he has done um, a scan just of thousands of businesses looking at Core Web Vitals. And I think that that article is going to be coming out in February. So worthwhile to come back to for that one. Yeah. Right on. How about you, Dana? 
Um, you know, kind of in the same boat. We really focused on, especially for local, you know, profiles, Google profiles, as well as, you know, on-site and content, I think more than Core Web Vitals. All right, Colin, you're the last one, man. Do you do anything with Core Web Vitals? Uh, not particularly. I mean, f from a local perspective, especially dealing with you know, smaller sites in a lot of cases, we, we just haven't seen correlation between, right. you know, blinking red and, and stuff going haywire within Search Console related to that and, and downplays in performance ranking. Um, so uh, that's been our experience. So we, we don't give it a ton of thought. We do in our audits mainly because uh, Core Web Vitals does have to do with the website. It has to do with organic in, this, in that sense. So there is that crossover, but we don't put a ton of effort into it. So, all right. And next question we have is from Rent Homes 123. Does GMB have a bug? Because I can only get to 85%. Yes. Colin, go for it. <laughs> yeah, actually. So that's a really interesting question because it had something on my mind related to uh, the slide deck that Ali just went through. And I think relatively high up on the three pack factors was completeness of GMB profile. Mm -hmm. um, and it got me thinking when I was doing the study. So, so to answer your question, yes, there is a bug that basically stops that percentage calculator. I think at 85, I don't think it can get up above 85. And it's been like that for a year. I don't think there's an end in sight. Um, so I was wondering if, if maybe, you know, part of, part of the reason why people think that is more of a factor is because Google's now saying to you, like, complete this. There's like a little uh, carrot at the end here. You get to fill out this whole percentage, yet it's absolutely impossible to, uh, to get that to 100%. Yeah, correct. And there is no fix in sight, but don't worry. It doesn't affect your performance yeah. or your ranking. So chill. <laughs> Take a chill pill. You'll be fine. Uh, we're just going to answer take two more questions. And then if you could hold your questions to the end, uh, we will be happy to do a lightning round on those. So, um, all right. So <clears throat> question, nothing about local business schema seems to pop up in the survey. I think there is something about schema in the survey, actually. Um, how about, and it's obvious, is it because it's not useful at all? What do you think, Ali? I think schema is in there. I think schema is in the local organic ranking factors. I think it does show up um, in the top 20. But I would say that um, that schema really, like what you're doing, what we focus on for local SEO is building um, local business schema. Um, and so that's just going to include the information that is you know, on the Google business profile, um, the basic you know, name, address, phone number, hours, basic information like that. And so, um, you know, it's my understanding that that's not really like going to, you know, boost your rankings by going and adding schema. But really, I think it was Joel Headley who um, gave this great visual of thinking of it kind of as like the the spine from which you can you can employ other types of schema that can be beneficial in, you know, employing um, like rich snippets, um, different featured snippets, getting, you know, stars on the, the SERP whenever you can get that to work with product schema. So it's basically like just kind of the backbone um, off of which you can, you know, have these other features, which I guess will have um, ranking benefits. But I don't know that there's specific ranking benefit to just putting local business schema on your site. Correct. It's more of an in, informational type of thing. Again, kind of going back to you're giving information to Google and then Google does mm -hmm. what it wants with it. Uh, it wants all the else. information. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, you might as well tell it and, and go from there. All right. Uh, I see a lot more questions coming in. So we are going to pause on the questions so that we, we can get it to the 2022 predictions. And then we will come back to the questions. All right. So... Dana, let's start with you first. In 2022, do you think that increasing in importance in relevant hyperlocalized localized content strategy, especially after the proximity update? So talk to us a little bit about your hyper-localized content strategy. Why do you think that's going to be so yeah. important? So kind of twofold, I think, as far as, you know, we're talking about um, not local pack ranking, but just organic local. I think having that hyper-localized content, especially in cities you know that have neighborhoods and things like that is going to be important um i could see you know google working more on justifications and maybe pulling in things like that 
um, it's kind of my prediction, you know, having that, like, you know, this mentions this landmark, this kind of thing could be something that Google could look at for profiles. Um, I also just think it's important um, to write localized content in the way that users are searching. Um, having, you know, if you're, you know, something like a walk-in clinic that, you know, has your kind of locals versus like traveler kind of audience, I think having things like universities, landmarks, is important to have that in your con content because it's going to give Google more information about you, especially as people are doing those near me searches or, you know, if you're in New York, you're like, I want a restaurant in the Flatiron District. Do you not? A lot of people don't just type in the main city, um, especially with like the local level um, and like how far people are willing to travel now for businesses. I think that's going to be very important and continue. Right on. Completely agree. 100%. Colin, what about you? Um, it, sorry, uh, Ben, like in relationship to that or, or we're, ta we're talking about localized content. So for instance, you know, the, the putting up of uh, a page about say hospitals in the area or putting up the uh, geo local pages, you know, say you're not, uh, you're in Dallas, Fort Worth, but you want to rank in another city or a suburb that's outside of Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, yeah, I think there, there's definitely some of the things that Dana mentioned that we've uh, tried to do some testing around and um, some were impactful, um, some others maybe not. But again, it, I think it, it's always going to come back down to the like competitiveness of the market that you're trying to make this happen within. Um, and in some markets, you'll be able to accomplish it 99% of the time. And in others, it's going to be uh, extremely difficult. Sure. I mean, obviously, it comes down to how many you know businesses are in that metro the same as you you know, how large the metropolitan area is, how many people you have. I mean, there's always going to, if those two figures are up, it's always going to be a heck of a lot of competition and harder to rank, whether it's organic or local. Absolutely. What do you mean about you, Ellie? What do you think? Yeah, I definitely agree. Important to um, be writing sort of this hyper, I like that term, the hyper localized um, content. Um, when we're, you know, looking at local SEO, we are obviously writing very local content. Um, I just think that businesses kind of need to snap out of this idea of having a location page that talks about the local library and the when the town was founded and, you know, all of these things that are historically used on these sort of doorway location pages, but actually giving, you know, relevant information um, and then another thing I was going to say is that um, adding sort of these like um, you're talking about not just searching for New York City but the Flatiron District and I think it was at the most recent White Spark Local Search Summit that um, there was a presentation talking about adding these sort of localities into the title tag um, so I think that that's valuable you know don't be afraid of the ellipses um, you can definitely add more content beyond that and it's a great place to put some of these um, these localities these sort of smaller neighborhoods um, so that you can rank for those as well. I think it was Joel who did a test on that actually where yeah. he like he was able to put tons of keywords into the title tag. Yeah, right? yeah, I think and it's a feature study. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. All right, cool. So moving on from that, uh, in reaction to the vicinity update, Colin and I both agree on this. And that is, is that merchants are going to open up more locations. They're going to have to, to, to combat with this. Um, and using, again, we were kind of talking about this earlier, but using a grid tracker, whether it's local Falcon or bright local, uh, you know, or um, place to scout, you know, it doesn't really matter. Just use one of those, see where you're great, where basically your drop off is. So if you're ranking one, then three, yep, the exact answer to the question for Zach, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and then you can start looking at new locations. One thing I do want to mention with this is, is the, the big thing that I'm uh, trying to get people to do with this is, is use a tracking number. If you're not using a tracking number, you know, then when you pop up these new locations, uh, you can use Google's AdWords planner to figure out if there's enough traffic in that area and that zip code. But then again, like I said, you know, if you're going to get a, like a temporary location to test it, use a tracking number to see how many sales you're getting from it. And then it becomes a very easy business equation. And if you're spending less than you're actually making, then you keep your location plain and simple. Uh, the only thing I would encourage is, is that if you are going to be popping up new locations, make sure you are in the guidelines. Otherwise, you will be heading towards an account level suspension faster than you can say, ouch. 
Uh, Colin, what do you got? <clears throat> yeah, so I, th I think uh, there's certain things like over time that make it into local SEO, um, like, like in terms of things we do that like require us to wear new hats. So if you think about spam fighting, for instance, um, at one time it wasn't a thing and then became a big thing and maybe it's not a big thing anymore based on the recent study, but it's still, a, it's a big thing. And it really requires you to put on like a detective hat or uh, a private investigator hat. Like, so now you're mm -hmm. stepping outside of traditional local SEO. The vicinity updates, um, in my opinion, it really solidified the idea, like Ben said, of like moving your office to a better location or uh, opening a new office is is like a, a legit local SEO tactic and, and something that can have, if done properly, a massive impact uh, on your local SEO, you know, your revenue, your business. So like, it's almost like we now have to wear uh, like a realtor local SEO hat. Um, and we've been doing this quite a bit. So in addition to the things Ben mentioned, so, so there's all these wonderful ways you can gather data to pick locations where you want to move to. The only uh, thing I would add on top of everything Ben said is um, looking to see what other competitors are, are located at these places. Um, so if you're thinking of opening up another office in a high rise building and you're a personal injury attorney, you definitely want to make sure that there isn't 20 other personal injuries, uh, personal injury attorneys at that location, because then you've got filtering issues, et cetera. Um, so, so I think like almost like every local SEO should now have some sort of checklist to be able to help clients, um, whether it's them approaching you saying, should we open up a new office or you approaching them saying, um, I think you could benefit from opening up another office here or maybe moving uh, if you're outside of, you know, where your, your, your customer base is or something like that. So here's our prediction for 2022 that we don't have. And that is, is that a company will pop up that does real estate for local SEO. There you go. <laughs> Not local SEO for real estate. Real yeah, estate local, for local yeah. SEO. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, okay, cool. Uh, Dana, what are your thoughts on this? I agree. I definitely think that we're going to see more businesses popping up. We're going to see some moves. Um, and I think for some, it'll make sense. And that, you know, using the grid trackers is important on the local level and being able to understand, you know, where you're ranking in the different, you know, markets. Yeah. yeah I was, mm, actually, you know, Allie, I'm going to throw this at you because I have an interesting thing that I'm thinking about here when it comes to the relationship between opening new offices and spam. Mm. So with more offices is also probably going to become more of a spam problem. Yeah. Because if people are not opening them up in the guidelines and they're like, well, I see everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to do it too. And I'm going to throw mm -hmm. up a bunch of SABs on my employees and my contractors' homes, and it's okay. Um, so I think that we'll actually probably see more spam coming from this. What do you think? Yeah, we could definitely see more spam. I think that's a matter of like making sure that you're within the guidelines. Um, like you said, if you're going to be popping up another location, definitely make sure that you're within the guidelines. Um, and like Colin said, make sure that you're not surrounded by competitors. I feel like that's a traditional thing is that like just in general, plazas seem to be sort of um, like thematic. Like you said, you'll find a bunch of lawyers in one spot. And I know when I've worked in in house you see like oh we're a bridal shop so we're going to go to this place where all the bridal shops are and it's like the worst thing you can do for a local seo um but yeah when it comes to spam i think we may see an increase if businesses are you know wise enough to pick up on the strategy of um opening new locations um but yeah i think colin make that checklist somebody needs to make that checklist for sure mm -hmm. chris asks a great question are we saying that you actually recommend opening a new office and having your clients spend thousands. It's a hard conversation to have. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only thing I'll say to that, though, Chris, really quick, is sometimes it doesn't cost thousands. If you're really good at it, um, and you, you you can basically get a broom closet. And I'm not saying you should get a broom closet. <laughs> I'm saying you could get a broom closet. Um, no, but I mean, the, we do it all the time for our clients. Uh, we've been doing it before the vicinity update. And it's actually not very difficult to get a place for a couple hundred bucks and then go with what I was talking about, which is testing. So if you open it up, let's just say, okay, for grins and giggles, you go with a WeWork and you make it into a SAB. 
So you have to have an executive office with signage. Executive office is going to cost you a couple hundred dollars a month. You got to get a sign. You got to get a phone number and some other documentation, right? But now it's only costing you a couple hundred dollars a month. So if it's not working for you and you've got your tracking phone number, which costs you like 20, 30 bucks, then, uh, and you see it's bringing in, you know, $10,000 worth of new business per month, then yeah, you, that's probably worth it. Spending 500, getting 10,000. Uh, as a matter of fact, you might even want to think about opening up an actual office at that point. So yes, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. So let's move on to our next prediction. Dana, you were saying that we should keep an eye on Apple Maps and niche directories. So I think that I'm not saying to chase after citations. I think kind of the days of having tons of citations is over. But I do think that, I mean, every year Apple Maps seems to tell us they have something up their sleeves and they never really roll anything out. So, you know, maybe this year is the time they come and finally try to catch up to where Google is. Um, but I do think that depending on your business, that it's still important to keep an eye, you know, if you're a restaurant, it's important to keep an eye on Yelp just because a lot of restaurant users are Yelp, you know, are Yelpers. And I think there's a good subset of the business there. And I think if, you know, you're a home advisor or a home, you know, repair business that I would make sure that I was at least where my competitors are. So if they're on house, I would make sure I have a profile. I would use UTM codes and track it. Apple made quite a few interesting moves last year. Yeah. Um, number one, you know, for those you don't who know, you have to have a storefront to actually get onto Apple Maps. You can't do it for a service or your based business yet. Um, so that's number one. Number two, what they did was is they uh, rolled out a new management interface, which allows you to manage multiple profiles and also have multiple managers and also get tied into the ecosystem of Apple so much more. Um, I'm not exactly sure on all of those different features. Dana, you're shaking your head, so it sounds like you know. And the last thing was is we know that Yelp powers the reviews on Apple. However, Apple has now started collecting their own uh, recommendations, basically. So star recommendations. Can't do native reviews yet. I think in 2022, if their agreement with Yelp is over, they're probably going to move towards that. Um, if it happened, maybe might happen this year. But um, yeah, so actually, I mean, Dan, do you want to expand on that a little further about the integrations that um, Apple has into its ecosystem? No, I think you kind of hit it on the head. But I, yeah, like if they're kind of breaking away from Yelp, I think that they you know, could have something up their sleeve and they're not just going to cut reviews out of their profiles. Yeah. So. How about you, Allie? What do you think? Any thoughts on this, Apple? Mm, nothing to add to that, really. Um, we have a listing service team that is, you know, focused on Apple listings. It's kind of out of my wheelhouse. Don't want to speak to it. All right. And what about you, Colin? Yeah, same. Um, definitely interested with this, this whole native reviews. Uh, Thing that's happening with Apple Maps. I'm excited about that. Um, Want to definitely test that um, and just sort of see what kind of impact it has if you start getting a good chunk of native reviews on Apple Maps from ranking perspective or how, however else you can track it. Um, yeah. Cool. Right on. Um, let's see. I'm going to start fast forwarding here a little bit. You know, the thing I think that's going to uh, happen with GM Google Business Profiles this year is going to be a lot more expanded Google business profiles in search experience. So, you know, we've got the ability to edit, we've got the ability to look at insights, make posts, upload images, respond to reviews, all of that without going into the Google business profile manager. So uh, again, we're kind of almost at that full parity between the two. So, but there's some things that are happening. I mean, even right now that are happening. Um, that are just getting full to, fully rolled out where you're going to, where you can claim a business profile directly in search. You know, you can work with your suspended profiles directly in search. This is all in new verifications in search. So again, I, I think that, you know, more and more of the individual features of Google business profiles are going to continue to this in search experience and that, you know, even us as agencies are going to have to figure out how to adapt to this. So for instance, 
you know, if doing a new verification now can be done this way, we probably are going to have to do it, you know, or it might make our lives easier. Who knows? Um, Colin, we'll start off with you. What do you think about this in search experience? Yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it, I mean, like every sign points to the fact that eventually everything that possibly can be managed within search will be. I, I, I mean, with Google, I mean, they can certainly pivot. Uh, I don't think it's gotten past the point of no return where they can just totally scrap this. Maybe it has, um, but but I, I think it's past the point of no return. And I think other than multi-location features and stuff like that, it's it, yeah, I think it'll all be in search uh, experience. Cool, Ellie? Don't have um, much to add. Um, I definitely agree with you. I think that the only thing I was just thinking as you were talking is how Q&A has sort of been this feature of the Google business profile that was strangely not in the dashboard. And I've been like waiting for it. And every time I give a presentation about it, I try to tell business owners where they can actually go to, you know, seed questions and answer questions. I think that's why it's so mismanaged. Um, but now I'm thinking, well, hopefully that'll integrate, you know, better and, and maybe we won't actually see it come into the dashboard. I don't know. Just kind of thought of that as we were talking. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should stop waiting. It's not coming. <laughs> stop. I think you can probably stop holding your breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but good, good thought. I mean, it's, it's a good point. I mean, and actually, if you think about it, we could guess because we don't know this mm -hmm. is that when they made that transition internally and they said, you know what, this in search experience, this is where we're going. Maybe that feature for Q and a, they said, you know what, let's just, we're, we've already coded it for this. We're not going to code it for that. Yeah. Basically. To go back and look at when Q&A came out, that's when they started working internally on this. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. What about you, Dana? Um, no, I agree. Um, the Q&A being in the search has always frustrated me too, Allie. Um, but it's, again, it's good for business owners that, you know, maybe aren't comfortable with the dashboard. So I think having the search, you know, experience is going to be beneficial for a lot of business owners, um, especially like single locations. Absolutely, cool, thank you. All right, so next one, we got two from Allie. So, <laughs> Allie, I'm kind of interested to hear your thoughts on this one. Justifications on more local pack results. How can we get more? Well, I think there was a Moz study that found um, justifications on about 50 to 60% of local packs. Um, and that I'm not sure when they conducted that study, but I just think that they're becoming more um, prevalent. We're seeing new types of justifications. Um, and like we said, Google, you know, is going and trying to grab information that they can um, for like services, which are feeding justifications. So I just think that this is something we're going to be talking more about. I see a lot of questions um, in the chat here. What are justifications? What are we talking about? So I think it's something that's not really well um, known or understood, um, but these, I kind of give a quick thing, justifications. Um, what this is, is it's like a small snippet of text from one of the features of Google Business Profile, and it will show really um, sort of predominantly in, in the, or prominently in the, um, in the, the results. So it'll either show in the local pack or the local finder, right, like within the listing, um, and so what it'll do is it'll maybe pull something from the reviews. Um, so say you're searching specifically for like, um, I don't know, I'm thinking of one recently, like if you're looking for a thrift store and so your search term has um, is for a thrift shop and then somebody has written a review and said, this is the best thrift shop ever. And they're using the same words that your search, um, your keyword was for your search term, then that can be highlighted and they can kind of Google will pull that review because they want to show you why am I, why am I seeing this business as a result? Um, and so Google is sort of justifying um, here's the connection we're making between what you're searching for and what we're showing you and so that's an example of like a review but it can also pull from post content which is why it's good to you know have really semantically related um, information in your um, your Google post have your keywords for your top services in there because Google can pull it and it'll just kind of bold it and that's how you know what Google is connecting um, but that's a justification um, Moz has a great article um, where Miriam Ellis kind of did a deep dive on all the different types of justifications so if you're not sure of what they look like I would go there there, take a look at some of the screenshots she's got you'll get a you'll get a grasp on it for sure yeah just i mean the role of the justifications i mean that was exciting for me in 2021 too because mm -hmm. i mean it justified 
a lot of what we do as local SEOs, yeah. right? You know, it's like those services, having services or products. It was kind of useless there for a while, quite a while. And now all of a sudden, hey, they show up in a justification. I'll take mm -hmm. it. It's awesome. Um, cool. So, Colin. Yeah, I, I, I love justifications. I, I think uh, they're just so powerful. And um, I, I saw a comment in there somewhere, too, about, you know, different types of posts being pulled in, like offer posts, uh, which is really cool too. Like even within post, depending on the post you select, you can get a different type of justification pulled in. Um, so, so even though, you know, posts, for instance, don't really impact ranking, um, certainly not to a, a, a se severe degree, um, there's a really important reason to use them. If, even if it's just for the justifications to help you stand out in the three pack compared to the other uh, two people that are showing up with you. I agree. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, also with justifications, I mean, I got to throw this out there, uh, that it can pick up also content that's on your website. So it can say this website has this mm -hmm. product or this website mentions. But again, Al what Ali said there, he was really, really smart. And that was, is that, you know, it's Google trying to justify the result for your query. So, um, Take that, that, think about that really quickly, and that'll kind of help you kind of craft your own strategy, you know, on getting reviews and things and posts and all of these different things. And Dana, what are your thoughts? I agree. I love them. I think they're great. I, you know, some other ones that we didn't mention, you know, they do menu highlights. So if you're a restaurant, it'll pull up and say, you know, menu mentions again from your website. Um, and you know, like in-store services, things like that. I think there's a lot of justifications and I think that they're just gonna continue. Cool, awesome. All right, so next one, and then we just got two more after this, is uh, <laughs> we're talking about photos, the importance of photos. Last year, um, also again, last year, the, the emphasis on photos was definitely elevated by Google. I mean, we know that they've been able to read images for a very long time. Um, I think it was started back in, what, 2011 or 2013 when they could OCR an image very easily and look at the text. Now, you know, if you look at things through the Google Vision API, you can really see what Google sees in these images. Um, they explore them through entities and they also explore them through labels. And they're actually distinctly different things. But I think that the, the core of this, uh, before I hand it over to the panel, is that Google can semantically understand very easily, actually, at this point, what it sees inside of an image, whether that be glasses, whether that be gloves, whether it be a car wreck. Um, and it's going to relate it back to your search, and it's going to show up the best image based on the intent of your search, which is really, I think, very useful and awesome. So, Ali, again, we're going to go ahead with you on this and lead on this one and tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this. Yeah, I just agree that they have become more important. And I just, I feel like we're only at like the ramp up of that. I think that we're going to see them become even more important. Like you said, Google can really understand an image. Um, and so um, it's a matter of, you know, making good choices when you're taking photos for your website and for your Google business profile. I feel like that's like kind of the application of what to do with this um, growing importance and Google's growing understanding of photos. Um, so, you know, that means not really relying on stock photos, trying to get, um, you know, unique photos of your business. And then thinking about it, um, Darren likes to give this example when he's talking about this, that um, most dentist websites, the banner image is this beautiful family with like gorgeous teeth and, and Google sees that photo and thinks happy family. They don't look at that photo and think, dentist, right? And so it's a matter of taking photos with the intention of understanding, okay, this isn't just for people coming to my site and, and looking and wanting to see this nice, happy family. It's also for Google to really understand, even through the images, not just the text, what is my business? And so a photo where you've got like the dentist, where he's clearly got, you know, like the, the whatever it is, the light and the, the equipment and everything so that Google can understand. You can actually take these photos 
run them through um, the, the Google Cloud AI and you can actually get an understanding. Google will tell you what it sees, what keyword it relates to that photo. Um, and so you can make small changes. Again, there was a presentation at the Whitesburg um, Local Search Summit where they showed an example of they had the, the dentist, but um, just the way that he was in the photo sort of obstructing the chair. And so Google said, doctor is what it saw. Um, and then they move things very slightly and now Google is saying dentist and like, that's what we want. We wanna understand, um, we want basically these keywords to be very closely tied to our photos. So I think businesses really need to get away from stock photos um, and take a look at, at how Google is understanding their photos. Exactly. And if you think about another thing too, and that is especially, I think this, this is definitely on mobile. I think this is also expressed on desktop too, is that if you're doing a search for say, uh, I don't know, pepperoni pizza near me, mm -hmm. then it's going to bring up, say, Pizza Hut, and it's going to show you a pepperoni pizza. If you search for sausage pizza near me, guess what? You're not going to get a pepperoni pizza now from Pizza Hut. You're going to get a sausage pizza. Mm -hmm. So this extends out. It yeah. extends out to automotive, et cetera. So uh, really key, especially like that the study you were talking about that was shown at, at the uh, White Spark Summit. Cool. Uh, Dana, thoughts? Yeah, um, as you were talking, Ellie, I was thinking about that photo with the dentist and the arm and how that was. Um, but I agree. I definitely think that getting away from stock photos and, you know, running it through the Google AI is important. And we're going to continue to see, you know, more of an emphasis on photos and quality photos. And Colin, any final thoughts on this? Only thing I would add is just, um, you know, always pay extra special attention to the photos on your GMB landing page. So, so whatever page you decide to connect to your Google My Business listing, um, I, I would say that's like a super high priority. Um, we actually noticed in one case where we were testing that the photos added to the GMB landing page actually impacted ranking. And then we found out that it was actually related to the alt text in the image. Um, so it had this like spillover effect uh, to the local ranking side of things. So um, that's all I would add comes back to fill in all the things <laughs> can't yeah. tell you how many websites i look at and they don't have alt text all right so um thank you for that all right so with that colin i actually want to go ahead and go look at your predict last prediction here before we move into the other one so you're saying that more local three-pack results for virtual services yeah Talk yeah about I this and, and this might actually be tied into, I know Ali has uh, a prediction, which I'm really curious to hear more about. Um, but this is, I was recently doing some searches and um, I was looking for virtual martial arts classes near me um, as part of this audit that we were doing. And uh, what's interesting is that Google will display a three pack for, for keywords that have virtual associated with them. And I, I swear I used to perform searches related to this a year ago, um, and they would almost never um, show like a localized result. And I think part of the reason behind this is, A, there, there's no categories inside Google My Business that have virtual except for it's like virtual office location or something like that. So Google, and, and then as part of their guidelines too, like like the, the rule that's been around since day one is you have to make in-person contact uh, in order to qualify for a listing. Technically virtual uh, doesn't mean that you have in-person contact, but um, in this three pack for the search term virtual martial arts classes near me, they were pulling in a justification uh, um, that was from the website. So, so on the website, they talk about their virtual services. So it's almost like Google is saying, okay, you know what? We, we don't have a current category for virtual because it's not really part of our guidelines, um, but we're accepting these other signals or justifications for still showing a three pack. Um, so that combined with the fact that we had the pandemic where a lot of business models went either hybrid or fully like virtual. Um, I think a lot of that will, will sort of stick around. Um, and, and we're just seeing different business models, uh, as, as technology increases, as the world changes. Uh, I think Google, like Google can't just forever be like, we're not allowing uh, any of these business models as part of our structure, let's say. So my thoughts on that really quick are, is, is that. So when uh, COVID first hit and when we kind of met with all the GMB teams, right, we started talking about a lot of these things and virtual was a big thing we talked about. 
I think that enough time has passed that the attribute for virtual and online is kicking in for search. If you remember, like for instance, um, black owned, right? Or veteran owned, et cetera, did not surface in search before when you type for a black owned business near me. However, they do now. And we know that's based on volume of searching, right? So I'm wondering if those two are tied together. And if you're setting up online and you're mentioning virtual on your website, that it's going to now draw a correlation between the two and therefore show that up and show that in search as well as the justification. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Interesting. Good, 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 uh, good call there, Colin. Um, Dana, you have any thoughts on this? No, I just think that's very interesting. Um, and look forward to kind of seeing more, you know, I'm thinking all the virtual services that are kind of, you know, as things change, I know, um, for a lot of, you know, gym clients, it was virtual classes would pop up um, kind of last year. So I would love to see kind of the increase in that. And what about you, Alan? Yeah, I think that's exciting. Um, it's an interesting change to think about for sure. Um, I think it kind of ties into my other prediction that I was um, that I put down here, but that's just um, maybe we'll see. And this is like is a total hope and a guess, uh, but what else is a prediction? Um, maybe we'll see more support for, you know, e-commerce businesses. And I think that's on the same wavelength as these virtual services. Um, you know, you're talking about businesses adapting post COVID, right? Hybrid models of businesses, um, businesses just changing, you know, forever businesses that may not go back to um, like an in-office experience where they'll have remote workers. And so how will businesses change? How do the guidelines, um, how will the guidelines change, right? As for which businesses can actually be on the maps because you have to have a physical location or be a service area business. But so it's interesting to think about that, but then um, I guess I'm wondering, will we see more features that um, are more um, applicable to businesses that are going a virtual model or like an online model? Um, and so examples of these types of um, features in Google My Business or Google Business Profile that already exist would be um, bookings during COVID pretty early on, I would say like maybe April 2020. Um, Google started to integrate for virtual um, appointments mm -hmm. and bookings, um, which mm -hmm. previously I don't think Google would have done because these are supposed to be, you know, businesses, physical businesses you can go yeah. to. Um, and so, you know, Google adapting to that was really interesting to see. And so we'll see, you know, how that booking feature maybe changes. Um, and then another thing that I think of, it's pre-COVID, but um, see what's in store, this feature where you can actually have your, your inventory displaying in the Google business profile, if you have, you know, UPC products, and and I think it's the pointy system to pull the, that information yep. in. I'm interested to see, um, I think Google is going to have to adapt for more virtual and more online businesses for sure. I definitely think that part of my prediction for this year, we think when it comes to e-commerce is I think they're going to extend the Google business profile experience more when it comes to doing a transaction directly from your Google business profile. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we already see that they're bringing in data for, you know, car dealerships. So you can show inventory, like you were saying, Allie, being able to show what's in store. Mm -hmm. Then we've got the new products. Well, not new, but we've got the product post with the, also the expanded visibility on your featured product. Right. And on top of that, what happened last year was, is Google started doing something with product posts it has not done with other features. And that is rejecting individual product posts for whatever reason from the nanny bot, right? <laughs> um, but all of these things I think point, and, and you mentioned booking, right? All of these things point to, well, is Google going to roll out a CMS? Uh, I'm not sorry, not cut to mention my system. <laughs> my bad. Uh, are they going to build out some kind of a, a you know, um, a system that tracks customers and allows them to do bookings and rebookings and gives you a customer relationship management system on the back end, maybe, you know, will they allow through Google Pay or something like that, people to purchase a product directly from the knowledge panel without even having to visit your website or go to any kind of e-commerce system? Um, that's tantalizing to me. And I think that that might come. Um, I do agree that they need, they're going to probably need to pivot and start th 
thinking about, you know, like pure play e-commerce, pure play virtual types of companies. I don't know though if pure play e-commerce would fit very much into their local, um, you know, but I think a, a customer who has a local presence, but also does e-commerce. Absolutely. I can't mm -hmm. see why not. Absolutely. Um, Colin, what are your thoughts on all this? Agree across the board. And I think it, it all kind of ties together. It's, it's really about just Google adapting to just changing ways of doing business. Um, and it's like, if, if you don't adapt, then uh, you're going to get left behind. And Google is not the type of company that uh, gets left behind. Uh, for, so, you know, if, if there's money to be made and you can make it work and fit it into the, the product, uh, whether you have to modify it a little bit, then it's, it's going to happen. And Dana, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the e-com aspect's interesting, especially with the kind of emphasis they have been putting on products um, with the new feature, um, you know, marketing and special and things like that. I think they'll definitely start testing something soon to try to make that shop experience kind of come to life. Yeah, because it's only going to benefit merchants and users, right? right. Um, cool. Well, with that, I'll just say for one more round or go, we'll go around real quick. Just, are there any other predictions or anything else you'd like to say before we go into our lightning round and start answering questions? Uh, I'm going to stop and start on my top right. Allie, what, anything else you'd like to add? Mm, no other predictions for me. We'll see. You can't really predict what Google's going to do. And it's always a wild ride in local SEO. So we'll see what happens. Right. Constantly changing. Colin. Don't. Um, I, I usually like can come up with maybe one prediction, uh, maybe two at like the beginning of the year. Um, so I got nothing really worthwhile to, to share in addition to those, to be honest. Dana? Yep, same. Well, cool. Time to get into the lightning round. Okay, so the way we're going to break this lightning round work is, is I'm going to start with Allie, then go to Colin, then go to Verdina. <laughs> so we're just going to kind of give you a grab bag of questions. If you can't answer it, no big deal. Then just pass it on to the next person. All right. So, um, so what do we do for a service business that works out of a home, uh, works out of a home office? I've had issues with getting them a GMB listing. I mean, Allie, this is a a business, a service area business that works out of a home office. So it looks like they're having problems. Probably yeah, getting should, suspended. Yeah, you might be getting a suspension or disabled listing. You should be able to. Um, I would definitely check the check in the Google Business Profile Manager to make sure that everything is within the guidelines. So open up those guidelines, take a look. It could be something that it could maybe be something other than your home address, something like you've got your hours set to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's sort of a red flag for Google. It could be something else. Um, if you're having a hard time getting a listing at home, because you should be able to um, get a service area business from your home if that is like your home base for your for your service area business, you should be able to do that. Yeah, the only other thing I would suggest is maybe going out and just investing a little bit and getting some citations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to list your address, but you can list at least the city and zip and state. Um, the, the Google might be having a hard time finding the existence of the mm -hmm. business, and that's it's it's a pretty common problem, but they don't tell you about it. So, that, yeah, that reminds me. Um, on the White Spark blog, Nyagoslav, who is our head of local search, he has written an article completely covering all of the citations you can get without an address. So it'll kind of give you your quick hit list, so you don't waste time trying to you know create listings where they won't let you without an address. So try that list for sure. Excellent, good point. Uh, what if you work by appointment? Colin, you actually had a, why don't you go ahead and answer that question because you have a good article on that one. Yeah. And then I apologize. I got to jump off. I got uh, a school pickup, uh, for my daughter looming. Um, yeah, by appointment only. Uh, so I guess the question is like, how do you, how does Google fit that in or how do you do it? If you're pure by appointment only, um, the sort of unspoken way to represent yourself is to kind of clear your hours. Um, so you just don't have any hours listed. Um, that would be the first thing. And then I would suggest like, like put something in your, your description, the Google, my business description, you can utilize Google posts to, to communicate the fact that you're by appointment only. Um, so there's no perfect way, uh, as far as how these are handled or accommodated, but you can get creative with it and 
that's kind of the the checkbox, the checklist that I use. Cool. And thank you for hanging out, Colin. I mean, I know we're running over here. We're 27 minutes over. So um, okay. thank you so Dana. much, guys. Thank you for Thanks, having buddy. me. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Colin. Colin. Bye. All right. Allie, Dana, you want to hang out for a couple more questions? Yeah, sure. Sure. All right. So then this one's going to go over to Dana. Um, if some of our reviews are not showing up on G, I'm sorry, Joseph asks, um, if some of the reviews are not showing up on GBP, but they show up on a customer's profile, is there a way to complain to Google and will Google do something about it? So if they're not on the actual profile, but just on local guides, like personal profile? Yep. So, I, 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 so I, I leave a review for you that. and I can see yeah. it on my profile, but you can't see it on your Google business profile. Um, I guess I've never really ran into that kind of issue, but I do think okay. that there is some relevance in, if it's on your actual business profile, I think there is relevance. Um, number one, being able to respond to reviews and having a strategy for that. And I think um, understanding when reviews um, violate Google's policy, that's kind of something else I think um, is important. You know, if you have a lot of ex-employees leaving reviews for you, I would flag those because that violates Google's policy um, if they say they worked there in the review. Um, I've gotten, okay. I've had a lot of success getting those taken down. Cool. I mean, I'll answer this question really quick just because I see it every single day. Um, so the answer is, is basically that your Google business profile, the review is being filtered for some reason from your Google business profile, which is why the user can still see it. You can't because it just never made it to you. Um, it is published, but just not published on your profile. So what you need to do is just take a screenshot of that, head over to the Google business uh, profile community. I'm never going to get it used to saying <laughs> that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to call it the GMB community. Uh, um, just head over to the GMB community and go ahead and post about your details of your business, including the dashboard link to your business and a screenshot of the review. Um, and then one of the product experts, we can go ahead and we can escalate that to Google and see if they can find it or if they are even going to publish it um, because they might not publish it. So, all right. So uh, anyway, on from that, <laughs> this is a fun one. All right. Uh, Raphael asks, Ali, why is GMB support so bad? <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> It's really, it's a struggle. I feel like every business owner and agency that's working on a business profile is going to have to come in contact with Google support at some point or another. Um, I think that there's a lot of reasons why Google support isn't really great. Um, but I mean, a lot of that, I mean, we found in the beginning of COVID, they um, were sort of overrun and understaffed. And so that was a particularly hard time. Um, I think Google is also trying to figure out what is the best way they can help people. You know, Twitter um, DMs used to be like a really nice and easy way. Chat, you know, has been hit and miss for a long time. Um, there's no phone number to call. Like if you're familiar with, you know, calling for Google ads, that might be something you're hoping for from support, but it's just not really an option for, um, for Google business profiles. But um, I would say maybe if, rather than answering why it's so bad, maybe more helpful to say some things that you can do to get better support. Um, and, and that would just be to really prepare ahead of time for whatever communication you're going to have with Google. I find that I get the most frustrated when I'm dealing with support if I don't provide like the information at the get-go. And, and having done a lot of the same reports to Google now, I know what they're looking for, um, but that's kind of hard when it's your first go. So always um, you know, provide your um, dashboard link, your, um, your unique link for your business. So the CID, you can get that um, from your listing. Um, I would say, you know, if you're submitting something like a redressal form for spam, gather as much evidence as you can. You kind of want to over prepare and and give information to Google. And sometimes Google support doesn't really have a clear understanding of their own guidelines. I often find myself quoting the guidelines in a report. Um, just I try to eliminate as much work as possible so that whoever ends up getting my um, submission 
has everything in front of them because I think that a lot of the delay for businesses in getting help is that you say, hey, I have this issue. And then they write you back and ask, can you send us your dashboard link? And then you wait another seven days for them to respond at having getting your dashboard link and they ask for something else. And so you can put yourself into like a month wait by doing that. So just sort of prepare as much information as you can for support. Give yourself the leg up when you're contacting them. Yeah, exactly. And the only other thing I'll say about why is DMC GMP support so bad, quote unquote, um, it has a lot to do with what some of the things that Ali said there. And that is, is that we perceive it as bad as because when we have a problem, we want to talk to somebody immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we actually rank for how to get in contact with Google My Business Support, like very well for it. And mm -hmm. we get phone calls all day long from people yeah. saying, are you Google? No, we're, we're, we're not Google. Uh, but anyway, so but yeah, so human beings want to talk to somebody. And when we can't, we immediately think it's bad. Also, because Google does things at scale, they do things that companies do at scale, like sending templated emails all the time. So that can also be perceived as bad because again, you're not having this communication going back and forth. It's just Google saying, for instance, in the case of a suspension, no, sorry, you're just out of the guidelines. So interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, Brian is saying he finds it easy to get in touch with GMB support. <laughs> both an email and a phone number on the Danish GMB side. Okay, well, you're lucky then. Very lucky. We exactly. We don't have it in the United States or Canada. All right. Um, and then I'll answer the second part of this question from Raphael, and then we'll move on really quickly. There were rumors that Google would charge for locations. Uh, this is, okay, so two years ago, somebody put out a survey over at Google. Some intern did this, and people are still talking about it to this very day. No, Google is not going to charge you for a Google My Business listing or features in Google My Business. Sorry. Um, it's not going to be that easy. All right. <clears throat> so let's see. I think. Dana, I think this one goes over to you. What should the focus be on if a business sells in an area as well as nationally? It's from Anne-Marie Borelli. Um, I think that from just like a local standpoint, then I would focus on local if I had a local store or like a brick and mortar type of business. Um, it's kind of, you know, that's where I would focus on GMB. Um, nationally, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of places I've seen don't have a lot of shops that are broken down by locality. So, you know, if you're having products on your listing, um, you kind of do have to put, you know, the shop URL that would be your main site. Um, but I think when it comes to local, um, that's where you would focus on. And then if you're trying to get, you know, more nationally, you know, if you're a franchise, you have corporate as help. Um, and then that's kind of where creating content and stuff on your website is going to be beneficial. Um, or if you have multi locations, putting you know the work in on each of those locations um, across the board, it's going to have to happen. Right on, cool. Thank you. All right, uh, <clears throat> Jonathan Tingi asks, how does the vicinity update affect service based businesses without office uh, storefronts, basically, like roofers and plumbers? I'll just take that one really quickly. And uh, actually, and I might pass this. Yeah, I'm going to pass this one around the room. Um, we have not seen this affect any of our service area based businesses whatsoever. It's only been storefronts for us, at least, that have been affected. Really quickly going around the room, Allie, storefronts, SABs, both? No effect on SABs so far, no. Okay. Dana? Same. All right. So it's little SABs, you're safe. <laughs> So far, uh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. Exactly. It'll wait till the next update comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I'll say is this is uh, a lot of people don't realize this service area based businesses. Your uh, ranking is actually determined based on. Well, part of your ranking is based on the verification address that you utilized when you first did your verification. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you are seeing any issues, it might just be where you verified from. All right. So let's see. Uh, uh okay 
Hashtag shorts is asking, what is the solution to the continuous suspension of commercial activity? I understand what you're talking about there, shorts. You're probably talking about a listing which is constantly getting suspended or multiple listings which are getting suspended. Um, I'm going to go with the first one, which is, is I think you were talking about a listing which is getting suspended, reinstated, suspended again, and then reinstated, and then suspended again. Um usually in a short period of time. This is what we call a reinstatement loop, basically. And usually actually does come down to Google not being able to justify the existence of the business. It can't find the information that is required on their side to see that the business is actually real. Now, there could be, of course, other reasons for it. I mean, it's a suspension, so there can be all sorts of different reasons um for suspicious activity uh, which we can't really get into so all right so i will just go ahead let's see if we can just find one or two more questions here really quick unless you two have something that you'd like to say about that question no oh, and not anything okay uh all right so let's see i think we're actually all done Just looking. Hi, Kim. Uh, Mike Hello. Peterson. Mike Peterson is asking where to find the Google AI interpretation of a photo. And uh, Mike, if you just go ahead and you Google Cloud Vision API, then you'll be able to find it. It's very easy to find. Awesome. Uh, with all that, I mean, look, what a great an hour and 38 minutes of content. If you have been sticking around for this entire time, thank you. But also, I hope you got your question answered. Thank you, Ben, Ali, Dana, Colin, who's uh, now picking up his kid, I hope, from school. Um, stick around tomorrow. We are back for day two. Dudacon day two starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and we are talking agency growth for the entire day. So if you're looking at, uh, at how to fast scale your agency, you're looking how to, uh, you're looking to see what industry trends are going to be happening in the agency digital marketing side of things, come back tomorrow again, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and we have some great talks for you then. Day two. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Until next time. Bye. Thanks so much.